I would like to call this meeting to order. This is the third meeting of the Truckee Meadows Community College Institutional Advisory Committee. Welcome to everybody who is here and joining us. This is a very exciting group and we hope to do some wonderful things. Uh, Lisa, can I have a roll call? Chairman Hutter? Here. Vice Chairman Nesquaga? Here. Councilmember Bender is absent. Councilmember Brown? Here. Councilmember Tra Davis? Here. Councilmember Hernandez is absent. Councilmember Kazmierski? Here. Councilmember Knudsen is absent. Councilmember McCormick is coming in late, I believe. Councilmember Thurman? Here. And Councilmember Woodring is absent today. Also, we have uh, Dee Dee Siegel. I'm here. John Adlish. Here. Stephanie Prevost. Here. And Henry Sosnowski. Here. Do we have quorum? We do have quorum. Thank you very much. Um, and the first item of business is, uh, is there any public comment at this time? Is there anybody who would like to speak to any subject uh, in the public? There will be another opportunity at the end of the meeting, so uh, if something comes up, uh, please let us know. And so I would like to move on to item three, uh, the approval of the minutes of uh, May 29th, 2015. Do I have a motion? Any For the record, John Thurman, I would move to accept the minutes as presented. Thank you. Do I have a second? I'll second. And Sean, uh, any comments, questions? Uh, hearing none, uh, I call for a vote. Uh, the minutes to be approved. Aye. 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 Thank you very much. Okay, and moving on. And we're going to keep this moving because we have a lot to do. So this is going to be sort of a run, <laughs> a three-hour marathon, if it were. Uh, <laughs> great information. Um, President Shaheen, hey, you start. All right, the next item is the President's update, and we will have another format uh, for it uh, coming up that will be more standardized, but let me just go through a few little housekeeping things. Members of the staff are not voting members, and um, there are no uh, questions of members of the Council. This is your meeting. Uh, there are no questions of those who will be presenting, but public comment, as Chair Hutter said, can be made before, after, or at any time the chair would like to call for public comment. Um, we have a special guest in the audience that I want to acknowledge him, a member of our Board of Regents, Kevin Melcher. Kevin, can you wave so everyone can see you? Thank you. <laughs> Kevin has attended both uh, the WNC, uh, Institutional Advisory Council meeting, and now he's here with us. He has been really an instrumental advocate for uh, community colleges on the Board of Regents. He has a long um, and distinguished career in education, in, at both in the classroom and in uh, K-12 uh, administration. So we're very pleased to have him with us today. Um, in the audience, you have also, um, I think, all three vice presidents are here. Our newest vice president is Barbara Buchanan, and she's just been with us a few weeks and doing a, an absolutely super job for us. And I think you've met the other vice presidents, members of the council have met the other vice presidents previously. Vice President Gutierrez is here and Vice President <laughs> Solomsas is over there. And we have a number of members of uh, the college community and they're gonna be ready to answer any questions that you may have. I'd like to proceed to um, the, the questions, what we did with the update today. It's not an overall college update. What it is doing is answering the questions that members of the council had previously. So one of the questions was about marketing. So that's the first tab that you have for a is a marketing report. And we do have uh, Kate Kirkpatrick here. Uh, there she is. And she can answer any questions you have. What I'd like to do is go through all four of the um, five of the updates and then 
and you can come back and ask questions, um, noting that we have 15 minutes for this item. <laughs> okay, the next report or question that you had was, what are we doing in terms of recruiting high school students? And so you have a report from Vice President Gutierrez, and any questions that you have on that, you may want to bring it back to another meeting, and we can go in more depth on what's going on there, or um, you can ask questions when, uh, when I finish. Okay, the next question was uh, for uh, Frank Woodbeck in terms of burning glass technology. So you have attachment uh, for C is the burning glass update and collaborative update provided by uh, uh, Executive Director Frank Woodbeck. You had another question and that was what are we doing, what's going on with the free college community college movement. So you have a sheet on free college um, uh, movement. <clears throat> and then um, there was uh, something new that's coming up. And so for the information of the council, um, the, the item on police consolidation that will be on the next Board of Regents agenda. And you can see there are a number of issues that must be addressed, staffing, equipment, governance, uh, the operational plan, budget, all of that for consolidated police of uh, Truckee Meadows Community College and the, the uh, uh, leadership will be with UNR. So UNR will um, be responsible for police services at TMCC. So that item will go to the September board meeting for the regents to discuss and determine what the timeline is. It's in the memo that that transition would occur if the board approves this item on January 1st. And that I did in less time. So now if you have questions. Hi. Um, this, these materials were sent out ahead of time. Does anybody have any uh, board members, any comments or questions on any of these items? Or has this, the materials handed out, answered most of your questions? I think we're in, in good shape. Do you want to take public comment? Yes. Um, I would like to take public comment on this. I know that uh, there was someone interested in speaking to one of these items, and I'd like to take that public comment at this time. Okay. So if you have a public comment, would you come forward, state your name for the record, position if you would like, and then you can make your comments. Thank you. Madam Chair, members of the board, President Chin. Thank you for the opportunity to say just a few words. In 1986, when I came here as president of Truckee Meadows Community College, there was a working relationship between the police department and here, part of the police department of UNR, and Truckee Meadows Community College. However, I didn't know that. I didn't know it because I had been here two and a half months before I saw the first police officer from UNR. I would like to suggest to you that do this is a terrible mistake for students of TNCC. I recently, as you have, seen a number of TV accounts of shooting shootings and so on down the line. I'm saddened by seeing the UNR movement to consume this police department. The safety of these students means a great deal to me and I know it means a lot to you. I would hope you would take action today to tell the Board of Regents that such a movement does not, for the most part, uh, help TMC and will, in the long run, endanger these students. Thank you. Sir. Thank you, sir. Before uh, departing, could you please state your name for the record, please? I'm John Galton. I apologize for not doing that. I've been doing this for years, right? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very, very much. <laughs> Any other comments on any of these topics? Thank you very much. Oh. No? Okay, sorry. Um, and so we will uh, move on uh, to number item, agenda item number five, a presentation um, on the uh, Northwest Commission on Colleges and Universities Accreditation. Good morning. Uh, I'm Lisa Bedman from the Office of Assessment and Planning. Uh, accreditation liaison officer. He's not able to be here today. 
and I'll talk a little bit about the process that the college is undergoing towards a regional reaccreditation. So regional accreditation occurs through one of six um, U.S. Department of Education recognized uh, organizations. Uh, you can see the territorial map there on the slides, and Nevada falls under the Northwest Commission on Colleges and Universities. Uh, colleges and, universities. and so uh, NWCCQ, their process is a seven-year accreditation cycle that asks a college or university to address um, five standards and 24 eligibility requirements. And it takes place over a year one, what they call mid-cycle year three, and a uh, year seven process. Uh, so in year end of year seven, a portion of the cycle, uh, in 2011, we underwent our year one reaccreditation. Uh, where we submitted a self-evaluation report for a perspective uh, look at where we're at with regard to standard number one. Standard number one speaks to our um, institutional mission and core themes, um, objectives and data measures for those objectives, as well as eligibility requirements two, to two and three, which fall under those lines. Uh, in 2013, we underwent the mid-cycle uh, accreditation process. Uh, again, that's another self-evaluation report where we speak to not only the first standard of our mission and core themes, uh, but standard two, which deals with institutional capacity and resources. And uh, again, to eligibility requirements number two and three, tying that all into our mission and core themes. Uh, at present, we are in the process of drafting our year seven evaluation report where we now have to speak to all five standards. So in addition to our mission and core themes, in addition to addressing uh, institutional resources and capacity, we now have to speak to the college's ability or its uh, institutional planning processes, its assessment processes, and its means of sustainability in the future. Uh, we now address all remaining eligibility requirements, which speak to, uh, to those as well. And so very briefly, um, our report is due to be submitted by September 1st. Uh, this has been a campus-wide effort where we've solicited um, a number of people to write some portions of the accreditation report that they have expertise in. So we are very appreciative of their contributions. And uh, Dr. Lance Bowen and I have now, uh, well, we're in the process of, of synthesizing that, making our report cohesive and presentable to the Northwest Commission, but uh, we do recognize the, the campus wide effort on that. And then we are scheduled to have the accreditors uh, visit our campus October 14th through 16th. So they will have uh, read the report, they will look for evidence um, that we are abiding by their standards and eligibility requirements, and they will conduct interviews um, with key members of the campus uh, to ensure we are in fact meeting those standards and eligibility requirements. Um, I am pleased to report that at present we have no outstanding recommendations or concerns that we still need to address uh, for the Northwest Commission. We are fully accredited. We are in fact seeking not accreditation but reaccreditation. Um, looking to the future, we, we do fully expect to be reaccredited. Uh, looking to the future, as we enter the next seven-year cycle, um, TMCC will take on uh, a little different change. As you're aware, at the June Board of Regents meeting, uh, TMCC was approved uh, by the Board of Regents two bachelors of applied science degrees. And so now we transition from merely an, uh, an associate granting institution to a bachelor's granting institution. And that requires us to submit a substantive change uh, form to the Northwest Commission, uh, which will then recognize us as a bachelor's to granting institutions and will follow their, uh, their standards and guidelines according to that. So that's where we uh, look to in the future, and I'm happy to take any questions. If I could just add a, a comment, could I ask all of the members of the audience that have been involved in this uh, putting together uh, Adding to all the information going into the accreditation report to please stand. All of you have worked on it. If you've worked on it anyway, please stand. 
if you've contributed in any way, I think <laughs> that's admirable. I can't tell you it's a very rigorous process, and the uh, Northwest Commission on Colleges and University takes their work very, very seriously. So after we have our visit, the report will then go back for a rigorous review by the uh, uh, board it's, itself. I had served, I had the pleasure of serving for six years on the Northwest uh, Commission on College and University Board, so I know how seriously they take the work. They read every word of every report. They discuss it in detail. And then after that, they, they issue their findings. And then we report that to the um, Board of Regents. But the Board of Regents does not um, uh, accredit an institution. This is an independent body that provides the accreditation. So it, the, it has really taken the work of, of many who are not in the audience today, uh, that um, it is a collaborative effort that is a very vigorous and rigorous one. And I want to thank um, um, uh, Dr. Dedman for her work and certainly um, uh, Dr. Lance Bowen for all the work that he has done and all the members of the college community that put so much heart and soul into this. So you'll hear us talking about our core themes that goes back to addressing our mission fulfillment. So the crediting body will look at what are your core themes to meet your mission and how have you proved that you've done that. So in the past, we used to be able to say, we know we're doing a good job, and you know, here are a few factors. Now we must be absolutely precise about how we are achieving our mission. Thank you very much. Any questions from council members? All right, well, this is doing very well. We will then uh, move on to uh, agenda item number six, uh, another presentation on remediation strategies and partnerships in TMCC High School Technical Pathways with Washoe County School District. Good morning, Madam Chair. I'm Marla Kennedy. I've been here since June the 15th, and I want to uh, identify a couple of our chairs for you, and I've asked them to deliver the first part of this pathways in response to the request for more information. But I would like to start by just telling you I've been here since June the 15th. I have come to an institution where I'm just overwhelmed by the partnerships, by the collaborations, but most importantly, by the wonderful instruction, the quality of instruction that we have in this institution. So I thought it was very fitting to introduce to you Natalie Russell, our chair of English, and Damien, who is also our chair for math. And so you'll take it away, sure. Thank you. <laughs> So I will speak on behalf of um, both uh, math departments and English departments uh, for purposes of brevity, but if you have a math specific question, um, Dr. is here to answer your question. So briefly, this, these are the topics that I'll touch on. Um, how we're aligning with the Board of Regents policy that is coming soon. Uh, national trends and best practices with both math and English disciplines, and our specific math and English department strategies, as well as technical pathways that Gretchen Sawyer will be addressing. So in order to align um, with the Board of Regents policy, we're looking for students to continually stay enrolled in math and English courses. So we don't want them to take breaks between their developmental and remedial courses and the gateway courses. So, you know, to keep their skills current and, and to finish sooner, right? Um, we also are encouraging faster gateway course completion um, for all other disciplines besides the STEM disciplines, the science, technology, engineering, and math. Um, we want the students to complete in one year. For those STEM disciplines, they have a year and a half to complete the gateway courses. And those gateway courses are the college level, um, like English 101, Math 120, 126. Uh, so those, those foundational college level courses. We're also wanting to improve that transition from high school to college. So we're working to align with recognizing the GPAs that they earned in, in high school as well as, of course, accepting the ACT scores that are now becoming standard across the school district. 
And we're not just aligning with the board policy, but also following these national trends and best practices in English and math. Um, across the country, um, many <laughs> English and math departments are offering accelerated courses, trying to get students to finish faster by um, both combining courses, so combining a, a remedial course with a gateway course, but also for English in particular, um, there used to be separate pathways, or there are still are some in some schools, but in many schools there used to be where they have to take three to six reading courses and then they would have to take three to six English courses. And so it makes sense, right? We really can't read and write in isolation. So combining those reading and writing courses um, for, you know, to really have a meaningful experience and to encourage um, faster completion, of course. Um, contextualized courses, so putting um, English in our math in a, a discipline-specific program to make it more relevant. Um, again, shorter paths, so we have reduced our levels of remedial courses here, um, and in math, they have also um, combined, you know, given extra support with a um, developmental remedial kind of lab component, as well as, um, again, we're short, shortening also course sequences with seven-week courses versus a traditional 16-week models, so we're having like English 101 in the first seven weeks and English 102 in the second seven weeks, and they do similar uh, things in math with math 96, which is the developmental combined with math 126, and also 126 and 127. Right. Yeah, so there are two um, gateway course courses. They also like our 101 and 102, they've also done a seven week, seven week model. So. So we're excited for students that they're, you know, getting through these courses and getting to take their, their major courses sooner. And again, aligning with the high schools for both GPA and testing, um, we've also established much closer relationships with the Washoe County Like Liberal Arts uh, Coordinator, um, and they're encouraging more writing in the high school curriculum. We've had um, identified high school teachers that are qualified to teach our courses in the high school classrooms, and you know, we're just looking forward to continuing those really positive relationships. The alternate college placement pathways also, we're taking if they get a 3.0 GPA, um, then we're allowing them into a gateway college level course. And specifically, and I've already touched on some of these already, we have these stretch courses, or instead of taking the remedial level course separately from the gateway course, they're combined and uh, stretched kind of over the semester to give students extra support. And the dual mini session courses, which are the seven week courses, again, the remedial um, English and reading combined, and the similar um, programs that I've already mentioned. And of course we know, you know many benefits of these um, these strategies of acceleration. So faster completion, improved retention, right? We want to keep the students that we have here, right? Um, because they are our greatest, um, you know, assets. And lower cost to the students, and we don't want them just taking course after course and, and paying for it when they can be successful in with fewer courses. And better success rates in both individual courses as well as overall, right, for the college. More graduation, um, more attainment of degrees. And so just to recap, these are what we're really trying to focus on. So alternate pathways, not putting everything on one uh, placement test or one, you know, just a GPA. So really giving students creative and alternate options in order to enter college. Um, more remediation early, so working with the high schools again closely and um, to increase that college readiness. And then also the increased access to workforce opportunities, um, which Gretchen will now discuss. And I'm happy to answer questions about English and do you need for math if you have any. And before we go to the next section, um, I really do want to acknowledge the work of our new chairs. 
Um, what we know is in math and in English, that is a major stumbling block for our students. If they can get through the math courses, and so you've heard about the acceleration and what we're trying to do here, but it takes really great leadership from our faculty. So I just want to acknowledge our two new chairs, Damien in, in, in math and um, Natalie in, in the work that she's doing in English, and that is leading to our core theme, of course, of uh, addressing student completion. So thank you, thank you, colleagues. And now on to the other partnership with the Washington County School District. Good morning, I'm Gretchen Sawyer. I'm the Executive Director of the TMCC Foundation and Institutional Advancement. And I am really excited to talk to you this morning about this wonderful collaborative project with the Washoe County School District thanks to Superintendent Davis for her leadership and for all the support from the community. We had Nancy McCormick from Edon testify before the Washoe County School District Board um, in support of this project. So now we are moving forward and I'm, I'm gonna provide you an overview of where we are with this project. So the project is an expansion of our already successful TMCC High School. And so how this is going to work is we are going to bring in 50 11th graders starting in August of 2016. And they are going to be participating in a Pathways program. And it's going to be 50 students the first year and then increase to 60 students the next year. Then with attrition, it's going to build out to 114 students. And this whole project has come about as a result of the workforce development needs in the community. We've been hearing from people in the community, from donors who are very interested in this project, who would call me constantly, what's, where, what's the status of this project? Because we are so interested in supporting this. So um, to give you an idea, of the various pathways that the students are going to participate in. Here's a list of the programs that are being emphasized. And students are going to graduate from high school with a diploma in one hand and a certificate in another. So they will be able to immediately be employed or continue on to college. To a little bit about the expansion of the high school so currently there are 230 students in the high school and then with an additional 50 to 60 11th graders added the total enrollment for the high school is going to grow to 354 students um, and as I mentioned the high school diploma as well as a certificate the students will be taking dual credits and we have um, two English and history courses offered, and we have dedicated space. So this Pathways is going to be at our Edison location at the Applied Technology Center. And as part of renovations that are going to be starting, the next phase of renovations, because currently there are some renovations going on, um, there are gonna be two dedicated high school classrooms and some space as a result. So to get into the finances, which is always what I'm very interested in, <laughs> funding projects, the school district is going to be providing an administrator and a faculty member. They are also funding the tuition, which we are providing at a 25% reduction. Um, and then they are also covering the lab and technology fees. Now, TMCC's commitment is to renovate, um, do our second phase of renovations at the Edison facility. That's not only accommodating this technical pathways, but also renovating for the huge growth that we're experiencing in all these workforce development areas. Um, the total for that project is $4.3 million. And I'm delighted to let you know that we had a donor who is funding the full amount. So we are moving forward with that renovation. Um, we're signing the contract with the donor next week. So we're really excited about that. Yeah. 
I think that deserves applause. Yes. <laughs> project that is starting next fall, so in August of 2016. So if you have any students who you know who are interested, please encourage them. They'll be applying through the same process that the TMCC high school students are. So does anybody have any questions? Thank you. Questions? I mean, I, absolutely amazing program. I cannot tell you how thrilled I am to hear about this and uh, anything, obviously, we can do to support this incredible thing and, and thank you so much Tracy for the, the uh, and support just, of the school district is incredible do I, have <laughs> I just want to thank everybody that worked on this project I know we've been going at it trying to hash out the details and it's nice to see that it's done and it'll be an amazing opportunity for students um, actually I do have a couple questions I don't know Are, yeah. am I on what? okay um, how do you sell that you've got 60 positions um, and I you know, it doesn't sound like a very large number, but it doesn't sell itself. So how do you, um, what's the plan for really um, informing 10th, 11th graders, probably starting younger than that, of this opportunity? That's a good question. So we are really going to build on the success of TMCC High School. We have applicants to TMCC High that we have to turn away. Um, and we, once we announce the gift, then we will have a website all set up with more information about how students apply. Um, we're also going to be doing recruiting and working with the school district. And I think part of that is when we go out to eighth graders, we talk about the opportunities afforded to them, the choices with our CTE and our signatures. And so we have parent nights where they come out, they learn, they ask questions. So it will be exposed just like the rest of the opportunities in, in the district. So I think there's going to be a great opportunity for kids and parents to understand the options for kids. And then another question that's probably more towards the uh, individual sitting, but you know, on the remediation side, how do you measure the, um, you know, the outcomes of your efforts? I mean, I think we were all surprised when we saw how many kids come out of high school needing remediation at the community college level. And unfortunately, it's probably something we're going to have to live with for a long time. But how do you know that you're making a dent in it? Um, so what, what measurements do you use to show your success? I think you should probably step up. <laughs> So yes, we're definitely tracking that progress in with multiple factors. One of them is persistence from the video courses into the, the college level gateway courses. So we track not just the retention in the developmental course and as well as the college level courses, but also the persistence from course to course and, and success rates, yes, success in the gateway, right. So not just persistence to that college level course, but success in that that gateway course. I'm Damien Ennis. Uh, in some cases, like our stretch course, we're able to take the remediation and put as kind of the prerequisite, just the, enough material to succeed in that gateway course. So in a very specific case, we can kind of narrow in directly into what they need to succeed in that gateway course. That always works. So about 10% versus 10% higher success rate in those stretch courses. Okay. Excuse me, uh, can I ask a question? Uh, the gate, I know, understand the remediation. What is a gateway? Yeah, so that, in our case, for math, it's Math 120, which is the kind of liberal arts math requirement for UNR, for us, and it's 126 for most other degrees. So it's that college course that gets you what you need for your degree. But it is a college level yes, it course. Is. Yes, it so, is. Okay, okay. It is a, um, it's accredited. Correct. 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 Thank you. So we call them gateways because they're gateway to a university experience to the next level. For our students that are technical students, we are really looking at embedding both English and math into the, uh, the curriculum so that those students have a different kind of pathway. They're not going to go on for a four-year degree. They're going to go on for a technical certification or a technical degree. 
as well as their, their high school diploma in the, in the program that we were looking at. They will have to have a pretty rigorous uh, screening process because once they come in as 11th graders, or when they come in as 10th graders for Team CC High School here, they have to be at a performance level where they can be integrated mainstream pretty quickly into college level courses. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any questions? Amazing things are happening and we're very excited to hear about them. I'm, I apologize, we keep coming back sometimes with the same questions, but we're, we're, it's so much happening here and it's all so exciting. We're kind of, our, our learning curve is fairly steep, but we, we're going to try very hard to do our best to uh, learn as fast as we can. Um, and now I'd like to move on to budget, or agenda item number seven, I'm sorry. Um, and if I could just say a couple of words of introduction. Um, at the last meeting, you had a, sort of the next level review of the budget, and this is even another level of review of the budget. As members of the council, this is what we really hope you will spend a lot of time and attention on, especially the section on uh, the kinds of needs that we have here at the Dandini campus. So we've got spectacular success in uh, two other facilities. The um, Edison, you just heard about the Edison gift at the Applied Technology Center, and then the Health Science Center um, up the road in Mount Rose Highway, which is co-located with the university. A spectacular success in the facilities there. But now we have really lagging behind uh, what will happen here at uh, the Dandini campus. So you're going to hear a little bit more about that. And uh, so uh, please take a, a careful look at, at the presentation materials because we will be going to um, the Board of Regents. They will ask your ideas um, and recommendations going forward as we present these projects. So Dr. Sloan says has been spending a lot of time and attention on this, and uh, she's going to take you into the, a deeper dive of the budget. Okay, Rachel. Good morning, or good morning, um, Madam Chair and members of the Board, Regent Melvin Sloan, Dean of the MCC Campus Community. Um, it's my pleasure once again to continue this briefing and journey about our fiscal and financial position. So before I go to Sai, I do want to add, uh, I know you asked a question about outcome measures on uh, remediation, and uh, including in our funding, funding formula is actually course completers for those courses. And so we get funding every time, of course, the students uh, complete those scores successfully or with an earned grade. Uh, and similarly, our performance pool, we are measured on the number of gate way course completers. And so it's it's a double benefit fiscally uh, as we improve our remediation program. Thank you. All right, so um, I want to share with you today leveraging community support. Um, and uh, if you look at the first slide, um, here is a slide that shows uh, between CSN, GBC, TMCC, and Western, the Community College in Nevada, uh, state operating allocation. And but the trend from 2008, when we have an economic recession, we continue to see a continued erosion of that public, public funding, uh, more so definitely on the northern community colleges. Uh, part of that is mitigated by um, fees from students. So part of it, we shifted, I don't want to use the word burden, but shifted part of it to the students. At the same time, uh, institutions have to look at cost efficiencies and you know, we have budget reductions uh, in it. Now that's not unique uh, in, in Western, uh, well it's not unique nationally. And in fact, if you look at this slide, these are the WICHE, well, Western Interchange uh, co Colleges in Higher Education States. Other than North Dakota and Wyoming, you'll see the purple line, which is from 2004, to the green line, which is 2013. You've seen the ratio between student fees and state allocation have really shifted. More on increase to the students and a decrease on um, pub, uh, state, or, uh, state or local government finance. So the next question is, is as we shift it to the students, how are our students coping? Um, certainly at TMCC, we've been very aggressive in inc increasing access to financial aid. And financial aid comes in many sources. A bulk of it comes from our federal sources. Uh, Sharon Warren is actually here, our, our director for financial aid. So if you do have additional question, and she provided this information. In fact, 81%, you know, like Pell Grants, um, 
and some federal loans come from uh, uh, federal sources. And uh, the next slide, you'll see that a bulk of it is grants. 49% come uh, followed by loans, and then student employment and scholarship comes next. In addition to that, um, as financial aid staff look into the unmet needs, there's almost a TMCC 33 million just in the fiscal year. And we cover that unmet need through attempt to working uh, student loans and work study grants. And we're very committed to provide more non-need, uh, need-based grants than merit-based grant. You'll see that ratio that 68% of our financial aid goes to need-based aid. So in addition to the student support stepping in, institutions in Nevada, community college institution in Nevada, has been very, very entrepreneurial and have really leverage community support through grants and contracts. If you see this slide, actually the next two slides, you have fiscal year 15 and fiscal year 2009. For TMCC, uh, in fiscal year 2009, our grants and contracts only compose 17% of our total funding source. And by 2015, we've been increased that by 31%. So a lot of efforts has been put into increasing grants and contracts and looking upon the community to help us fill in the gap of our um, operations. And to help us with that community investment, we couldn't do it, TMCC couldn't do it without the support of our foundation. And so I'm gonna ask um, Gretchen as well to give you an update about the foundation and how they are able to help TMCC leverage that support. Thank you, Rachel. Again, Gretchen Sawyer, Executive Director of the Foundation and Institutional Advancement. I will provide you with a brief overview of the activities of the foundation. I could stand up here for a long time and talk to you about what we do in the foundation, but I've narrowed it down. So the foundation was established in 1982, and we are a separate 501c3 nonprofit federal income tax exempt organization. So we receive contributions in support of the college. Our mission is to solicit, receive, and manage gift revenues for the college. We are governed by a board of trustees um, and they are members of the community who serve as ambassadors for us, help us to raise funds, and also forge Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, that's great. Um, and forge partnerships with individuals, corporations, private foundations, anyone who would be in support of the college. So the foundation reaches out to all of those groups, the individuals, corporations, foundations um, for support. In addition, we are responsible in the foundation for overseeing the federal and state grant functions for the college. The revenue that comes in from the foundation has totaled approximately, <coughs> excuse me, $2 million in cash over the past few years. However, this year we're anticipating our goal is $4.9 million. And that's a result of some gifts, some nice sizable gifts that have come in. Additional funds come in through the federal and straight state grants, pledges, and in-kind gifts. So to talk a little bit about the federal and state grants, to follow up on what Dr. Solomsas was saying, um, in fiscal year 2012, we received, our awards totaled roughly $3 million. Well, in fiscal year 14, that increased to $9 million and we anticipate a 10% growth each year. So historically, prior to fiscal year 2012, the grant revenue that we received was pretty much through the state of Nevada and the Department of Education. So now, in addition to those sources of revenue, we also receive funding from the U.S. Department of Labor, Employment, and Training Administration. 
Administration, what is abbreviated as TACT, it's much easier to say, um, the U.S. Department of Commerce, the National Science Foundation, and others. To talk a little bit about our major gifts campaign, and in 2010, a campaign was initiated with the goal of raising $25 million, which is really unprecedented for a community college. And it was through the leadership of Dr. Sheehan and my predecessor that made this campaign a resounding success. So funds for this campaign are helping to build the new health science center that is slated to open on August 31st with our nursing programs starting down there. Um, which is terrific. Also raising money for the first phase of renovations that are going on right now at the Applied Technology Center, as well as for support of programs, including our Success First program, which reaches out to first generation students, as well as providing funding for scholarships, you heard the need from um, Dr. Solomsas, and also technology needs. The campaign was a resounding success, exceeding the $25 million goal, raising $26 million. So that is fantastic, and now we are moving forward with a number of new initiatives. Recent gifts that have come in, um, as I mentioned for the technical pathways, are the $4.3 million gift for the Applied Technology Center. Well, okay, so then we received this great gift. We have Dr. Sheehan lets us breathe for about 30 seconds and then says, okay, on to the next project. <laughs> <laughs> so now we are focusing on our Keystone, the Redfield Performing Arts Center. The lease on that center expires a year from now and it's an aging facility. So we'd love to bring a black box theater to campus. So that's what we're working on in addition to some renovations here in Red Mountain that will provide event space and much more student space that is badly needed. So that's our, our next um, phase. So we raise money in the foundation for scholarships. Well, that $33 million in unmet need is huge. And the need for private donations to scholarships is also enormous. As an example, this year we received 1,300 applications from students seeking some financial assistance. We're only able to award 275 scholarships not even meeting a quarter of the need. So that's really a priority for us, is to raise additional funds to help those students who really need it. We also raise funds for program support, such as the Success First, the Veterans, the Technical Pathways. We also have the Jacobs Presidential Scholars Program. And those are all areas that we need private support. We also have endowments and our endowments are managed by the Nevada System of Higher Education. And many of those endowments fund scholarships, but some of them fund other programs as well. And that really segues well into planned giving, because that's an area that we're going to be growing as well. And that's the opportunity for individuals to give a gift through their estate. The most simple um, method is to leave a percentage of one's estate in their will and then it just comes to the college in endowment or however the, do the donor designates. Um, the last item is a corporate campaign that we are going to be focusing on this fall. With all this new industry coming in, into town, with all the companies that are benefiting from our trained workforce that's coming out of TMCC, it's a natural partnership with a number of corporations, and so that's a new initiative that we're going to be working on. So in closing, I'm pleased to announce that we've made three new hires in the foundation as a result of a restructuring. They're not new positions, they're restructured positions, and so now we have six 
in the foundation and we have a grants office and so I'd like to ask Tammy to stand. Tammy's our grants manager and she's done a fantastic job, been with us for nearly two years. And then we have Laura Vargas, our grant proposal specialist, who's new to us this, this week. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very excited to have her here. And then also want to introduce Kathy Kohler. She's our donor stewardship coordinator, and she's in her second week. So very excited to have them on board. And then Tara Hawkins will be our new development officer scholarship manager starting next week. And then um, Becky Jostin is our executive assistant who is right now holding down the board. So I've just provided you a real brief um, overview, thrown some numbers at you. So if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to ask. Thank you very much. Um, I know that we have some more, but I'd just like to uh, point out to the council members that I, this is so exciting that all these things are happening and we need to, I think, coordinate carefully as we go out into the community that we are working in conjunction and support of each other and not running into each other. So I thank you and I hope that you will put up with us coming to you quite a bit and coordinating our activities. And before we go into the next section, I would just say that for the presidential performance metrics that the Board of Regents looks at, every time we have a periodic uh, review, which comes up every three years, uh, there are three areas where we must show increased performance, grants, contracts, special events, fundraising, and those are areas where we must have targets and we must reach a higher goal. And so I am very excited by the energetic new team that's coming aboard. I think we're going to do great things in grants. And I think we're going to do some wonderful things in raising more capital dollars. So I'm, I'm very pleased with the new team that's aboard. Madam Chair, just, just a quick question. When you were talking about increased corporate support and contributions uh, how much or what are you g receiving now and how much do you anticipate growing that Gretchen Sawyer for the record we are not receiving a whole bunch of corporate support right now so that's why we're really focused on this initiative to help raise funds and we're going to develop an entire campaign with goals and different recognition levels for corporations. Okay, all right, thank you. Thank you. All right, for the record, Rachel Soms us again. This time I can see all your beautiful faces. <laughs> <laughs> um, so just a recap, certainly for a community college, um, just the word community really means a lot, particularly as we sustain ourselves. You know, we get support from the state, we get support from our students, and definitely our community is stepping up, uh, even during this uh, difficult times of budget and economic recession. Similarly, so we got our operating fund, we also have our capital needs. You know, we have to maintain our beautiful campus, campuses or locations. And as uh, Gretchen has reported, definitely has relied upon, <coughs> again, the community to help us, if, not only with investing in our future, but our deferred maintenance. So in 2014, or prior to 2014, we engaged the campus community, because every 10 years, we have to review our facility master plan. You know, what are we gonna do? How are we gonna meet student needs? What are the current utilization? And so every 10 years, we're we have to submit to the board an updated facility master plan. And we've done that, we engaged the whole campus community and presented to the board that they approved in June 2014. Now, depending on funding, we don't want it to be just another report that puts on the shelf uh, with President Sheehan's leadership. We know we need to commit to what was stated in the master plan and begin to address it. So immediately after that facility master plan was approved, we commenced, again, thanks to the community who stepped up, two projects, the Redfield Health Science Center and uh, IGT Phase One, again, through a grant from the uh, Economic Development Authority, EDA, Federal EDA. So we were able to proceed with two of the major 
needs, uh, facility needs that we, we need for, for nursing and the other one is our facility in Edison. Uh, at the same time, we wanted to really see where we need to focus our efforts, particularly in terms of gaining community support. So President Sheehan has asked Robin Powers to actually engage the campus community. And so we set those priorities early this year, January, February 14, and really find out where should we really put our efforts in order to implement the master plan. And then uh, surprisingly, we've got phase two of our IGT, so we're also proceeding for that. So out of those priorities came parking and transit and arts in the student life space. So in my next presentation, I want to focus on those future developments. But before that, let me share with you the sources of our capital funds. Um, it used to be when we have facility needs, we do go to the state and ask the state to prioritize buildings, uh, requests anywhere from 5 million to 10 million. In addition, the state has set aside funds, what they call the deferred maintenance. So we put in our requests. Uh, luckily for higher education, there's a 50 million set aside called the HEC check or HEC check funds. And so we've been able to rely on that despite the continued reduction in capital support to higher education or to the state as a whole. Out of that 50 million, we split it among um, eight institutions based on, based on square footage, and TMCC typically get about 800,000 every two years. And we really use that to do whatever deferred maintenance that we can get out of it. In addition, the students, when they pay their fees, part of that goes to a capital improvement fee fund. Uh, that's about $4.53. So that brings in another 800,000. So if you think about it, all the things between uh, striping the parking lot to addressing HVAC in one area or suddenly an emergency flooding occurs in one of our storage, we have to rely between this 850 from Hexet and the student's capital improvement fee. <coughs> so if we have a 10 million new nursing facility, that won't cut it. So we'll have to go to the foundation and the local community that help we need this facility, and this is why. We've also begin to, we're beginning to really explore those creative financing sources, uh, public-private partnership, and recently the Board of Regents have begun to introduce this new market tax credit, so I'll share that with you as well. So TMCC becoming entrepreneurial. This is so far the capital support that we've received uh, in the last two or three years that help us move our facility master plan. Again, a big uh, shout out to f f local foundations, William N. Pennington, uh, Neil J. Redfield, the Herb and Maxine Jacobs Foundation, and of course on the federal grants, we got our federal EDA, and again, from the William N. Pennington Foundation. The next slides, I'm not gonna go through it, but um, these are the four priorities that the campus, um, and we have embraced it as an institution, so from the classified to the students, administrators and faculty said, we want you to focus on these priorities, classrooms and labs, parking and transit services, the art center, and the student life. They're not in any priority order, they're more in priority if we get the funding. And as you can tell, we're, we have better luck of getting funding for classroom and labs than parking. You know? <laughs> Nobody wants to have their naming rights on a parking lot. And so that's how we prioritize this. But parking is at hand. And so this is what we've done to really pursue our parking and transit needs. And, and, and in TMCC, I'm, I'm just so proud because we really embrace sustainability. It's not just parking. The group and the campus community really said we have to address the transit need as well. Because we do have a number of our students who take the bus to any of our campuses locations. So from the master plan and the group prioritization, we convene a parking and transit task force. Under Stephanie's uh, leadership, we have two from the students who are very active and, and really very vocal of what the needs are and the solutions that we can put in place. Faculty was there, administrators, and certainly classified was also represented. Uh, the task force look at different alternatives to address, again, both parking and transit. Uh, from that recommendation, we brought it to the campus community. SGA took the leadership again. They did a survey to kind of get an assessment of the whole campus community, thoroughly discuss it um, in their meetings. And so we have 
a plan moving forward. And, our, and in that plan, we're gonna continue to engage the campus community in hopes by December we will get board approval and uh, we can begin the implementation of it, both the construction of the new parking and also a shuttle service to meet the service gap in our transit. So briefly, what is that plan that uh, the campus community uh, looked at? Uh, we looked at several alternatives when uh, regarding parking. And the parking immediate need is really not growth and more parking capacity. It was more just to sustain what we have. Part of our capacity here at Dandini campus is 377 stalls in DRI, DRI research. And any time now, in fact, in about two weeks, that particular lot, we have to vacate because DRI will be getting a new tenant. And so we will be short 377 stalls. So the immediate need is to replace that. And we look at different options on how to address that. So we wanted to replace overflow parking. Uh, the best site that was chosen and, and recommended by our consultant was to do it on the north side. So facilities is right here, it's, it's right on that corner. It will cost us 2.4 million because it will take a lot of fill, as you know, we're in a slope. So it's not like, you know, you can just grade it for, you know, 100,000 and you're good to go. And that's what we're doing right now. It will, guess, it will get us 130 stalls, but not the 300 stalls that we need. In addition on the transit services, our students get a discount pass. So if you heard of the Wolf Pass for UNR, we have our Wizard Pass. Uh, and our students get the benefit of getting, for only $115 a semester or a year, um, compared to $60 a month if they get a monthly pass. And they can ride the bus anywhere. Um, in addition, in Dundini, as compared to Medwood or Edison, where there's a lot of bus service right in Dandini there's only one bus that goes up the hill. It's number 15. There used to be two, but RTC had to cut their service due to you know, budget as well. So there is a bus that goes on the north side, number 717, but unfortunately, you know, from Virginia to Park Boulevard, but it stops right by the sheriff's office. So students who come from that side or who have to take the bus, they will start walk up the hill in Rattle. And so we know it's a gap. And so we discuss about, and in, in coordination with UNR, try to develop a shuttle service to kind of pick up demand and hopefully in time RTC can take over that demand. And so that's what we're doing. So between these two, our proposed funding will be using some of our capital improvement fee that we have saved up. Uh, those are actually funds that we were going to use for those two projects, but because of community support, we didn't have to use it. So now we can re redirect it to parking again because not a lot of foundation will support, you know, or fund parking. In addition, we're looking into asking the students to um, assess a fee, uh, get their support from that, and then get the board support. Between parking and transit, we're thinking it will be about a dollar per credit fee. And the students spoke and said, we're, so far, there's support, but not on online courses, which makes sense. Our online students neither come to park nor use the bus. And so that's what we're trying to pursue, and we're going to continue to engage the campus to get that support before the board approval. Richard, before you go on to the next section, <clears throat> I just want to uh, stop at this point to talk about this, because this will then go to our Board of Regents. We're scheduled for or anticipating in December. So the Board of Regents will have to approve this plan for us to assess any fee. And then we have a lot of work in between that to make sure that the students understand, even though it's a very small fee, it has to have overwhelming student support in order for us to go forward. So we have the student piece to, to get together, and then we have the board approval before we can do this. But it's one of our most immediate needs. So the recommendation of the council will be something that will be sought. So do you have any questions before we go into a little bit further down the line? This is like right now, we need this right now. Um, a little bit further down the line, we're, we need uh, the other projects that, um, that uh, Rachel will talk about. So can I just stop for any questions right now? Does anybody have? Um I was fortunate enough to be able to have a presentation on this uh, before. I have a quick question. Um, Dr. Solomsas, you said that we're losing the DRI lots in two weeks. 
Oh my gosh. <laughs> 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 semester, yeah. <laughs> the semester starts in two weeks. Yes, but we are developing um, a temporary park. So we, oh, yeah. we, graded, <laughs> we graded the North Park Lab. We're going to get 130. And we're working with DRI to see if we can use the, the dog leg. We call it the dog leg, the paid park lab right on the north to, with the focus that that will get us you know, some additional stalls. So I think we have a plan to for moving from this lot to the next lot. They're, they're just temporary, though. OK. Thank you. It's bright. Nice. Any it's other? early. Don't, don't go to the <laughs> five minutes before your class. Yeah. Uh, hmm. Any other questions from council members at this time? I think we can probably I'm, I'm wondering if the council members feel this is feasible, something that they would want to support in the future, or do you need more information? I think why, um, perhaps we could discuss a little bit further in our, that next section, the final section where we are having discussion. Could we do that? Absolutely. You can okay. bring it under new business for the next right. for an or, update. Or yeah. Actually, we can review a little bit. We'll keep this moving. More information. We're not tying people up, and then uh, we'll see how it goes in that next section. Sounds good. Okay. So I think All right. The next project and vision that the campus community wants us to engage on is um, the Arts Center. Um, as Gretchen has reported, we've been in Keystone for 10 years or so. Um, it, it served us well, but it definitely had some issues. Um, we've had flooding. Uh, we've invested quite a bit to make it work. We have our uh, portable storage at the back uh, for the performances. And we had some safety concerns um, every so often, uh, particularly when our performing arts students will have to practice late at night. And so our commitment is to, um, as stated in the 2004 master plan and again in 2014, is to bring the performing arts program to the Dantini campus. And we're looking into a block box theater to support that. But we wanted to look at it in a way that also addressed the student life component that our students are asking. They need outdoor learning spaces and indoor learning spaces. So we have this beautiful plaza, as you know, um, right on, is that north, still on the north side of our area. And if we strategically put the performing arts within that plaza, we will be able, one of the things about our plaza, it's a beautiful space except it's windy. And so one of the areas is this is an opportunity to also mitigate the wind factor so that that particular facility or that space could be used more by students. In fact, we have a small outdoor amphitheater there. So in addition to the block box, by doing some minor landscaping and hardscaping within that area, we would be able to enhance more outdoor learning spaces, not just for students, but also for faculty, You know, bringing their students outside. We have sunny weather here all the time and we have that beautiful space and we really want to um, capitalize on it in addition the indoor space as you know right here just outside our student center that's actually the student center student space and we put their little spaces so they can gather and we have a little office for our uh, student government association but when we have events what do we do we pull all the uh, uh, furniture out and we set up put stages and we displace them. And so we really need to provide them their, those gathering spaces and, and, and community spaces. And so part of the plan is also to perhaps building a second floor here, putting the event center there, giving the students the first floor of the student center life, uh, the student center uh, student life, and more spaces for clubs. Our clubs has grown from 10 to from 60. Four when I started to, I think there's 27. 27. So we need spaces for those clubs to convene because right now they try to just see what classroom is available or any conference room that's available. So we're, we're trying to incorporate uh, those kind of needs into one plan and, 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 um, and support for this project. Uh, we've engaged students. Uh, the block tie events, we started to do that, and the president has committed uh, with her first donation of 25000 to really put it to the arts center. And now we're really pursuing, like Gretchen said, uh, a 30 seconds break, and here we go back to uh, gaining some community support. We also wanted to see how we can explore some creative financing, like the new market tax credit. So 
So here's how we look about possibly financing this project. For the art center, you know, the ideal space and design so far we have conceptually would be about 11.5 million, 12 million. But we have a plan, and a part of it could be filled by this creative financing called New Market Tax Credit, which I'll um, explain with you more. But if we are not successful in getting that, we have a strategy to scale down the project to 8 million if we need to, by redirecting the lease payment we're doing with Keystone, so that could bring in 2 million upfront, using some of our local capital fee fund balance again, um, getting that community donor pledges, we're hoping we can get 3 million out of that. And on the student center, be a combination of community pledges using our local fund balance and going back to the students and see if this is something they can support with a fee. A big component of this that will help lower some of those needs from those other areas will be this new market tax credit. New market tax credit was actually, has been in place for two decades now. Uh, it's a federal program and the state actually had one last session but they didn't uh, fund it uh, this coming session. What it is is a way for the federal government to invest into what they call distress areas or severely distressed areas and to encourage investors, banks, private companies to invest in those communities, they give them tax credit. So us uh, in Dandini, we are actually in, a, so you have to qualify, you have to be in a severely distressed area. And in Dandini, we are. In fact, as compared to UNLV Medical School, and they're trying to pursue that, they're in a distressed area, but Dandini campus is what they call severely distressed area because we're in the Sun Valley region. Um, so that provides us opportunity for this uh, funding source. Hmm. 32 billion has been released by the feds last May and they release annually uh, an amount. It goes to what they call the community development entities, which are typically banks and investors. And they would look at projects for its merit and would fund it. If we're able to pop, and they fund in both ways, capital and operating. On the capital side, what happens is they finance uh, about 30% of your project. So this will be when we talk about 15 million, maybe 5 million. And within that, we will only pay interest to set, and the interest is low, it's like 1% or less than 1%. We pay interest for the next seven years, and then after seven years when they use their tax credit, the loan is forgiven. So in essence, it is a grant. Uh, it, it does have certainly some costs, uh, to put it together, but so the loser will be the feds because with their tax credit investment of five million, us the recipient may, may get maybe three and a half to four million, but for us it's still three and a half, four million from zero. So it's still a grant for institutions like us. Uh, a lot of uh, higher education institutions have actually used the new market tax credits. UNLV, when they made that presentation to the board, has provided a list of universities. But for community colleges, just our neighbor um, in Oregon, Oregon community colleges have been using this since 2008. And their most recent project is at Lane Community College. They funded their 20 million downtown campus that includes a new market tax credit. So there's really some opportunities in, uh, in pursuing this particular uh, tax credit. We are, we have hired a consultant, the same consultant UNLV is using right now, J.A. Barrett Company. They are in Las Vegas. They're expert in this field. They know how to navigate it, the kinds of applications. So we're hoping with their support, we'll be able to at least assess the, the viability, the feasibility of a new market tax credit for this project. Any questions? Well, thank you very much. I think we're probably all going to have lots of questions. I'm not sure if right now, but does anybody have, have a question? We do have time for some questions, and we certainly we have the experts here. Uh, does anybody have anything? I'm sure we'll be back again once more with questions that we all have a lot to absorb here. Um, I was able to have a presentation earlier on some of these projects, and uh, the uh, parking lot certainly is an immediate question and uh, was very interesting about the transit something we should all learn a little bit more about is how do students get here in other words we all talk about trying to get more students here we have to make sure they can get 
physically get to the campus. So thank you very much. And you want to do that now? Uh, Maria is passing me a little note here, but we are actually ahead of schedule. Thank you very much, everybody. So we will take a 10 minute break so you can get some more coffee or use the facilities. Thank you. All right, moving on to agenda item number eight, a presentation on the Economic Planners Indicators Committee report by the Economic Development Authority of Western Nevada, EDON, by our council member, Mike Kazmierski. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Madam Chair. Uh, Mike Kazmierski, EDON. And there'll be more information on the slides than I will actually touch on, so I just, a lot of it's for your takeaway. So let me get through this pretty quick. Um, first, by start by saying we have unprecedented growth expected in the next couple of years. Most of you have heard that. Most of you don't believe that. At least that's my sense, because it's so big and so dramatic that it's hard for people to comprehend. And that's really one of the points I'd like to make as we go through here. It will affect everything. It will affect this institution, in my view, more than most. And so understanding what that growth is and how it's going to make a difference is, is part of, I think, our challenge as we look at what is, what are we looking at from a community college assessment perspective and meeting the needs of this community in the near term. So with that as kind of a scare the heck out of you warning, let me push into it. Uh, first off, EDON is a nonprofit econo economic development agency that basically coordinates the, the efforts of the region in a way that allows us to attract, retain, and grow quality jobs. Our focus is, though, on primary jobs, a primary job being a job where most of the customers and most of the services are provided outside the region. Tesla will not sell very many, very many cars in Reno or Nevada, but they will sell them somewhere else, and when they sell them, that money comes into the region, whether it's cars, batteries, same thing with Microsoft. Those are the kinds of companies that we focus on. And if we can attract and grow those companies, all the other companies automatically grow because there's a lot more wealth in the region. So just a quick kind of why we focus on primary-based jobs. Our, our uh, focus has been over the last several years pretty um, directed toward attracting quality companies, retaining our existing quality primary companies, and growing the entrepreneurial ecosystem in a way to kind of get us set up for future growth. This metric is one of our most uh, significant, the one we follow and report on on a monthly basis. Uh, Dr. Sheehan is on our board. She sees this every month. So what it tells you is if a company visits us, and these are monthly visits to the region that we personally manage and control and support, if we can get them to visit the region, more than 70% of the time they will decide to come here if they make a decision. So a company that is looking at multiple locations, and Tesla was on that list, if they come here and we have a chance to show them what a great place this is, 70 plus, and in fact last year it's 80% of the time, that company will decide to come here. So knowing that, we put all of our marketing resources four years ago on improving this metric. And you can see we've gone from four visits a month to 11, almost 11 now so far this year, last month we had 14. So a pretty dramatic increase in visits, which automatically means if your closure rate continues, you see the growth in attracting primary jobs to the region. And that bar at the bottom was our five-year average before we really got focused on attracting companies. And each year it's been pretty dramatic since, and that does not include Tesla numbers. I just listed a couple of companies really for, for uh, for us to look at and see, okay, we're providing workforce for these companies. What do they need? And when you look at this list, this is the first of several. What we actually brought into the community last year, you can see manufacturing service tends to be um, um, call centers, uh, back office operation kinds of jobs. Uh, clear capital, though, you look at those 400 jobs, those are $60,000 a year jobs that are in the financial sector. So sometimes service is, is a pretty uh, significant addition to our, our community here. Another list, you can see manufacturing and distribution still very high. 
And then finally, as you get to the bottom of what we did in the calendar year 2014, companies we worked with, a lot of companies came here that we didn't interact with. So this is just a pretty solid, probably 80 to 90% benchmark on what's happening and what just happened. And we list in here just the first year uh, of Tesla, but when you look at that number, 4,000 new jobs, remember these are primary jobs. For every primary job, there's one to two additional secondary jobs that come to our region. So last year, without a single Tesla job actually coming, we're talking about a lot of growth, and we know Tesla and Switch and others are in the pipeline now that will impact us going forward. Clearly, Tesla's a big deal, but the more important thing from an economic development perspective is it's helped to change our brand. We have worked very aggressively to help people understand this is a business community with growing business economy, yet our reputation is one of tourism and gaming. That's great, tourism and gaming will always be important, but it's only 8% of our economy, yet it, you, are, you would ask somebody what percentage of your economy it is. Even now, you'll hear numbers between 25 and 55%. It's 8%, and it's declining, not that it's declining, but it's staying stable while the rest of the economy is growing in other areas. So we are becoming an advanced manufacturing hub. These are pending announcements, and the reason I put this up is so you know what's coming. In fact, we sent a press release out yesterday with four of the smaller companies you see out here. Um, and again, it's mostly manufacturing and mostly distribution. These are all done deals. You just haven't, haven't been announced. We'll have an announcement next week, that 300 job, and you notice that not, most of them are not coming from California. That is a change from what it was four years ago. Four, year, four years ago, our strategy was get California to realize what a great place Reno was. And as we brought more and more companies, we've expanded that marketing message to really get the world to understand what a great place the Reno Sparks is, and Tesla has put an exclamation point on that marketing message. Again, these jobs are all done and will be announced in the near term. Let's scale about this number. Again, remember these are primary jobs. Remember, for every one of these jobs, we're going to add one or two additional jobs in other sectors. You'll need another nurse. You'll need another attorney. Maybe not. You'll need, <laughs> you'll need other things. Other, our economy grows when you add these primary jobs. This is the top of a list of 152 prospects we're working with now. So imagine that list going down three floors, because that's about how long it would be at that size. This is just the top of the list that's nearing a decision. We're working with 152 companies. Now five new companies visited us last week. So when people say, well, you know, everyone's scared and, and um, you know, Tesla's coming, so no one else will come, and things are quieting down. It's not quieting down. It's getting, it's getting more intense. And that scares the hell out of me, because if we don't have the workforce to meet the needs of these employers, and they're coming anyhow, what are we going to do? And a lot of that workforce is going to have to be attracted to the region, but much of it's also going to have to be upgraded. Our existing workforce, where we may have a $25,000 job now, can come here and in a year jump into a $45,000, $50,000 advanced manufacturing job and you know, basically double their income. So we have opportunities based on what's going on with this demand. We have demand now that's unprecedented. So 6,392 jobs, we're not going to get them all. But if our percentages work out right, we'll get 70 to 80 percent. And oh, by the way, when you put this 70 to 80 percent with the 1,400 we know already, we have, in essence, a Tesla landing in our community in the next year that no one knows about. And Tesla happens in five years. So when everyone says Tesla, Tesla, the sky's falling Tesla, yeah, Tesla's wonderful, but that's a five-year impact. We have something like this happening in less than a year. Again, manufacturing, so when I was interested in, and uh, talked to Jim New and, and afterwards and talked about what, you know, we're talking about those 60 jobs that are in the skill sets that are support our manufacturing. You know, where is that, how is that gonna happen? You know, 60 a year, isn't going to scratch the surface of these new manufacturing employer needs. It needs to be more like 600, in all honesty. When you're adding what we project to be 10,000 jobs a year for the next five years, if you look at that and say, okay, half of our numbers are manufacturing, 
and maybe 40 percent of that 10,000 is, is um, what we're looking at from a primary employer perspective, four to five thousand, so you're talking about two to three thousand manufacturing jobs each year for the next five years, and we're looking at training 60. So the scale of the challenge is far beyond what this community has considered in the past. Corporate headquarters are an area we've put a lot of emphasis on in, in the very recent, uh, since I've been here. The reason for that is when you bring a corporate headquarters, you bring stability, you bring executives, you bring conferences, you bring a lot of other things besides just jobs. And to move our corporate headquarters number up to a record at 13 this past year, very exciting, and we're continuing to focus on that area. Tesla has helped us. You know, four years ago, people didn't want to have Reno on their business card as their corporate headquarters. It just didn't have the right ring. That's changing. So that's attraction. A few things happening on our attraction side, but retention is equally important. We've got between five and 600 primary employers here. We haven't visited them all, but we're working on it over 200 a year. And of the ones we visit and the ones we survey and talk to, 83% are growing. That's not in any of our numbers. 83% of them are growing. That should scare you as well. Uh, we assisted. Uh, 1,300 new jobs, companies we worked with. Uh, there's a whole lot of growth happening in the onesies and twosies. And as we add more primary jobs, our existing industry is likely to grow even faster. And then finally, on the entrepreneurial side, when you look at future growth, when you look at branding, when you look at revitalization of downtown, entrepreneurs, millennials, creativity, university engagement in our downtown, revitalization, all of that kind of works together. In fact, I would argue we need a community college campus in the core of our downtown in the not too distant future. And I think finding space for that would be um, probably a whole lot cheaper than building a 30 or $40 million building. So it may be something we look at at some point because a lot of the millennials don't even have cars. And it's a long bus ride from downtown to here it's not a very far drive, but we've made it hard on our bus system. If we had a campus down there, maybe we can help address some of those issues as we go forward. So the millennials, what we're seeing here, you see that in the middle, Excellence in Economic Development Award, Silver Award, uh, just to brag a little about what we have done with our entrepreneurial program, which we didn't have four years ago. We, are, we got a gold award by the National, International Economic Developers Council last year. This year in October, we will receive two gold awards for the entrepreneurial efforts of this region. The first gold award of any type this state has ever received from the Economic Development Council. So we're doing things that are cutting edge. We're doing things that are making a difference in our entrepreneurial ecosystem, and it's going to help us revitalize our community. And when you look at the numbers we have there, those are hardcore numbers we're pretty comfortable with. If we were to take off on the entrepreneurial side, those numbers will get even bigger. So pretty exciting growth as we go forward on the startup entrepreneurial side. So I, met, I, I mentioned the growth piece. The point here is when we had rapid growth here before, 20% growth in our cost of construction in 1999, for example, one year, 20% growth in cost of construction. That was when we had 2.2% growth. Our historic growth is 1.2, and we project 4 to 5% growth in the next five years. And are we on that, on that track? Well, we had 3.3% last year, and that was before the Tesla announcement. So we're very likely, and based on our analysis, our numbers, our prospects, and our incredible activity, we think 4% to 5% is very realistic. In fact, it could be conservative. That's where the EPIC report comes in. <coughs> That was all the warm up on the EPIC because the EPIC report, Economic Planning Indi Indicators Committee report, is all about, okay, let's believe there's growth. Now what do we do about it? Do we just sit here and wait until it hits us in the face and then scramble around like a bunch of chickens with our head cut off? Or we actually plan for it and try and get out in front of it? And the purpose of the EPIC report was to do just that. Understand the growth, figure out where it's going to impact, and give the community some tools from a data perspective to start to get out in front of this before it becomes a true crisis. You see the EPIC members, a very broad-based community um, involvement, 
a technical involvement. We've got all the planning agencies across the state involved. Um, fairly conservative group of people that we have gotten to agree on some numbers, which was not easy. Um, Maria and her support has been a part of the, the program from day one. The assumptions we really looked at, job growth that we knew about, you throw Tesla in the mix, you throw in some other stuff, uh, projected out for five years using basically TRI, the Tahoe Reno Industrial Center is ground zero because that's where we'll see the job part and then the impact on the five county region around it. And this covers the scope of work. We, we identified some scenarios. Um, and really, we're going to update this report as we get data to do just that. The five counties around the industrial area and obviously mostly around uh, what we have here is in the metro area, you can see on the map there, we broke that into 18 epic zones listed here. And the epic zones, we have data that drills down into the census tracts of each epic zone. So, for example, if you go into North Reno and pull that epic zone up, you'll be able to drill into each of the census tracts to see detailed data on parts of that zone. Here are the, the uh, scenarios that we ultimately agreed to. A, B1, B2, and C, you can see job growth and population kind of, it gives you a little bit of a choice if you want to be more conservative or more aggressive in planning. Um, you know, from our view, and we can see a little bit further down the pipeline than most, that 52,000 jobs and 64,000 population is probably pretty realistic. You'll hear other government entities who can't fathom 64,000 new people in five years use lower population numbers. Again, part of that is this is, for those of you who've <coughs> read the, the Black Swan kind of event, this is that kind of event for our community, and most people have a hard time understanding what it's going to do to us. We have in the report the heat map indicators of where we see the job growth in the different scenarios, as well as the population growth. And from a housing perspective, and for those of you who saw my scare the heck out of you article on housing, uh, again, based on, you go back to 2012, we've been growing at 10% a year, and most people don't realize it. When you throw in what we have coming down the pipeline, if you have tried to buy a house or rent a house lately, you know this is, this is very real. And the good news is our average wages are going up. The bad news if you're an employer is the average wages are going up. <laughs> so you better get out in front of it or you're going to lose all your good employees. Any questions? I do have a question. Um, Dee Dee Siegel, Classified Council President. We're talking about all this growth, and I was looking at um, the pie chart here for all to see. And it looks like most of this stuff is going to be happening off of USA Parkway. As, as a resident of Fernley, Nevada, how, how are our highways, or specifically Interstate 80, how is that going, what's going to happen with that to keep up with the traffic that's going to start flowing into that area? Well, about half of the primary growth will happen there. So if you say 50,000, of which, let's just say it's a one-to-one -one ratio, it's about 1.4 ratio, but let's just say half of that, 25,000 ends up in USA Parkway, or ends up as primary, half of that, or, you know, 15, 12 to 15,000 will end up there in TRI on top of what they have now, which is 5,000. You're talking about 20,000 people, but you've got to divide it by three because most of that is shift work. So it's not that dramatic an impact, and some of that will, will not necessarily come into the Reno-Sparks area. You're right, some of it will go out to Fernley. Fernley will see a dramatic growth. Mm -hmm. Some of it will go out, um, the new highway out to Silver Springs, that will draw some out. So what's coming up and down the interstate will be <coughs> significant, but when you drive down there now, there's almost nothing. So it's not gonna be uh, a traffic jam. Oh, good. So then you're saying that the, the road um, from USA Parkway to Silver Springs is actually finally happening? Oh, it'll be done by, D they're saying the end of 2017, early 2018. Okay. Yes. <coughs> yes um, if I may ask a question, first of all, a little clarity. I'm very excited about manufacturing growing. Uh, we are still a fairly small percentage of the, po of the economy, which I think most people don't really understand because we've 
sort of out in front now, but it's very exciting. We are growing because it is a highly skilled jobs and the, the pay is certainly better. Um, I have a question just uh, and a, a comment, the first one being, being from the manufacturing area, is that these jobs are not all machinist jobs. When you sh have manufacturing jobs, you have the entire spectrum. Uh, very little at this time, because it's all advanced manufacturing as they define it. But you're talking about all these people coming in. You're talking about accountants. You're talking about QA people. You are talking about your logistics people, your supply chain managers. Uh, if you do any work in aerospace or anything, you have your contract managers. So there's quite a wide spectrum of jobs. So we will be looking to the uh, community for people across a broad spectrum, not just you know, machinists or, and everybody's going to have, they're all STEM jobs. There is no non-STEM job in there. And having said that, um, how do you see, you know, based on your numbers, the number of individuals we're going to have to train, you know, bring in, you know, to meet the commitments I know that we've made to these companies coming in. The state has made commitments to provide a workforce. And how many students, if we had to train them all here at TMCC on an annual basis, how many individuals are we going to have to try and move through this uh, institution? Just raw numbers. Our estimate would be around 2,000 manufacturing jobs a year. So if we took a number just to work with for this group, that we need to not only make sure that, and we believe that my opinion is that the training is here and that the companies have communicated what they're going to need, but the question is, so we're going to have to find 2,000 people or so in the community to take advantage of these courses so that they will be prepared to go to work in the manufacturing sector, is that correct well, analysis? That's a good analysis, but first they have to want to, and we... That's, well, that's what I'm saying, is the biggest thing, is when uh, Michonne and I were speaking earlier about a manufacturing um, uh, oriented programs in the high schools, they're just not getting the students, which we know has been a manufacturing problem. We have a... Well, part of the, like Congress, nobody likes us. Part of that, if, if I could, is, you know, I don't think anyone in this room, other than you, Madam Chair, actually talked to your kids about manufacturing as a profession. It was something we did in the 1950s, assembly line, dirty, you, you, need, you can do better than that. And so what we have now is an attitude problem that needs to be adjusted towards manufacturing. We are becoming an advanced manufacturing hub, and in other advanced manufacturing hubs nationally, it was it was the right thing to do, it was a smart thing to do, and now it's becoming with Tesla the cool thing to do to be in advanced manufacturing. And, and we have to somehow communicate to the community that we need the best and the brightest. This is, these are not jobs, I mean we have a wide spectrum of jobs, but we are really looking for students who wish to come to TMCC and really excel and learn and are excited about what they're doing. Well so. 60 to 80,000 is the average wage of, of a mid-level advanced manufacturing job. And my guess is uh, most of the jobs we have in the region are less than that. So it's a upgrade of our, you know, our opportunity for our kids, and yet we don't understand it. And men, most of these jobs can be, pr the pr preparation for entry into these jobs and can be done at TMCC, and it is where most of the training will occur. So we are going to expect all you wonderful people who are doing all these great things to uh, absorb this somehow. One final point, and I've had a couple of uh, presentations out to other groups. Uh, Tesla is going to bring a lot of people in. That name will help. But a lot of people will come here and not get picked up by Tesla and have opportunities to go somewhere else. So we will have a growth in the region. But we also have what our existing manufacturers don't believe yet and realize is a huge um, problem with their workforce. Because Tesla, it's a lot cheaper to hire someone that's doing it in town and bring them over and give them a 20% pay raise. And all of a sudden, you wake up one day and all your talent is working for Tesla. Or not just Tesla, it could be the guy down the street who's a little bit smarter and has bumped his pay 20%. And now your employees are going there. And the next thing you know, we've got gaps in our existing industry that need to be filled. 
that are, it's just going to happen and we just don't believe it yet. But we're already seeing it. We're seeing a tightening where it's actually very difficult to find very good employees. We, we're, you know, we, we do a lot of training, all manufacturers do, but it is difficult to find individuals now. So, uh, and it's going to get tighter. And again, we are, that's why we have to keep all the programs running. And that may be, as we talk to you, John, about um, getting existing industry more involved in what we're doing. If we are providing the talent that they can hire, I think you're going to find them more willing to support and engage at the community college level. Thank you very much. And, you know, if anybody isn't scared to death by that. Uh, but we can do it. That's what's so exciting. We can do that. Thank you so very much. And um, now we're going to, uh, are there any more questions? I'm sorry, I was doing all the talking there. I get very excited about manufacturing. Um, having spent five generations in it, um, I don't know anything else. Um, any other questions? Okay, so we will be moving on to action item uh, number nine um, on our agenda. Uh, this is something that I really looked forward to, and this is where the council members and everyone sitting up here, um, a discussion of what is this group? Why are we here? We get together, we have all these wonderful presentations, we've all learned a lot, but from my viewpoint, a lot of us have served on many, many boards where we learned a lot, but we didn't seem to do anything. And you wondered why you were there. You were getting a brilliant education on all sorts of subjects, but were you actually making a change? Were you contributing as a result of all of this? And we want to make sure that this council does, we, we have a charge from NSHE to do something, and uh, I want to make sure we actually give it a good try to, to affect change, to meet what we're supposed to be doing, which is bringing the community to the college, the college to the community. And I think uh, with Mike's presentation, we have a fairly good challenge of what we might be doing. Uh, it's not just manufacturing. We have many, many communities, many industries that need to be supported. And um, I think we have heard a lot of things today. I did mention that uh, we need to work in concert with other groups at the at Truckee Meadows, especially the uh, foundation, that we're all in the same direction and working with the same people and that uh, we coordinate our activities uh, to the benefit of Truckee Meadows, which I think is our ultimate goal. But, uh, and, and Many wonderful things have happened uh, with the sector councils. I think <coughs> Nevada, having been in workforce development in this state for 10 years now, uh, we met, many wonderful things have happened. We do have wonderful relationships between industry and economic development and uh, the governor's office and the K-12 and the community colleges. We do have very good open communication. We just need to make sure more people use them, is my view, because we've done some great things and there's been hard work on everybody's side. And we're, we need to recognize what's there and augment it and make it better. And um, I was very excited by everybody's comments and I thank you all for par really participating. I was very excited we went um, out to all the council members and said, hi, here's what we're supposed to be doing. How should we do this? And we got wonderful, wonderful suggestions back. And we were, I was very excited. So I would really like to just open this to the council members, given these presentations we've had today in the last two meetings. How, how do we go forward? How do we follow up on our mission to be the communication between the community and the school and the school and the community and the regions. I mean, we're supposed to be, that is our mission. And so I'm gonna put John on the <laughs> hot seat because I know John and ask him of these, I'm sure we've all read these, um, basically looking at the section things IAC members could do. In other words, 
suggestions of how we can do our mission. And I want to stress, I do not expect those of us sitting here to do actually all of the work ourselves. It's one of, you know, sort of the Tom Sawyer thing. Who, how can we convince our neighbors, our other people in our industries to become engaged? So, John? Well, thank you. Um, well, the, answering the questions to the to the list was interesting in the vacuum of my office, yeah. but I think being here put some light on some different points that I might want to bring up. Uh, the the thing that so far this morning that really stood out to me was the lack of corporate participation in TMCC, and I'm guessing it's probably throughout the state when it comes to the institutions of higher education. And, and the thing that has always struck me ever since I've been in the area is that we aren't a community of corporate headquarters. And I think when you have that opportunity to deal with the corporate headquarters, you get an entirely different level of participation with higher education. And I'm really glad to hear, Mike, that we have more corporate headquarters headed this direction. Uh, we may not end up with uh, Tesla's headquarters, and, uh, and I'm not ruling it out if I was in their shoes, but um, I, I think that you know, the, you, you're close enough to them because of where they are that, that we should be able to see some benefits there. So I, I think that you know, corporate involvement, corporate investment in the education system in the state of Nevada is critical, especially here in northern Nevada and especially here at TMCC uh, is one of the keys. Um, some of the things that I've noticed just on TV and stuff was the ad campaign, TMCC, You Complete Me, which I loved. Uh, I don't know if it's still running or not, but I loved that campaign. I thought it gave a great message to the community uh, and the uh, access to uh, the, uh, what is available, uh, TMCC. So, you know, that's kind of my, in general, the thoughts and directions that I think that activities should be headed for. Certainly more corporate uh, you know, involvement uh, with TMCC. I, it would be, they're an answer to a lot of the workforce that they're going to need. So engaging them both on the level of getting them to understand that TMCC, they have to encourage people to support TMCC both financially and to look to TMCC for their uh, employees. Yeah, ex exactly. Um, I, I think, you know, just corporate donations are critical towards the development of the institution that they're going to turn to. Uh, but secondly, I think that there's great opportunities for de development of internships, on-the-job training opportunities uh, as well. Uh, customized training, in, you know, that would be, you know, uh, established here, but taking on taking it on site to Tesla or whoever. Uh, it went to, once you bring it to them, the employer is much more likely to give the hours necessary to the employee to participate in that training than they are if you have to send them off site to another location. So I think that that type of corporate involvement and interaction is, is going to be critical to getting their buy-in. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Keep going. I, and and um, I want to make sure everyone understands we're talking about all industries here. We're not just talking about manufacturing because, as Mike pointed out, for every manufacturing job, you now have to have support around that family or individuals who, especially people moving in. So we're, every, everything's going to, we're going to need more of every type of skilled worker. So, Marissa. I agree um, with John in the fact that I think internship opportunities with corporations are just of huge value and I don't think corporations realize that that is out there or that they can um, provide an opportunity to a student and it, it's kind of a win-win situation because the student can come in and intern with the corporation and then they can see there may be an opportunity to hire that person to stay on in employment. and. That actually happened to us at the hospital association. We had one of our participants through the workforce grant. She had gone through training to be a community health care worker, and there's not a lot of health care um, facilities that are hiring those yet because they don't get reimbursed. And so we brought her in to kind of help us with the grant and kind of learn a little bit more about health care. And we ended up hiring her into a support role in our, in, in our company. And then, um, 
you know, she's with us now, but I, I and we also took on a social worker to help with the program too. And uh, she was a great intern and she went on to increase her, she went on to a master's program to increase her education. But you know, you don't, I don't think that people, that's not in the forefront of people's mind. So I think that, you know, it's kind of free help and it also helps that person um, develop uh, more knowledge about that particular career path. So I think that's important. I think we need to get that out to the community to let people know that those opportunities are available to them. Thank you. Sean? Um, I think what really interests me personally is how we um, market to students, high school students, middle school students, and their parents on what options are available for their kids post high school. Um, I think there are some things being done that are kind of standard things that we do currently to engage high school students, but I really think we've got to turn it on its ear and be creative in terms of how we communicate with that population. Um, you know, when you look at the last few years, and I, I'm kind of guilty of this myself, my parents really pounded in us about going to college, going to college, going to college. But the reality of it is, is there's probably a larger percentage that aren't going to college that a community college really suits. So, you know, how do we again communicate to that high school audience? What most people in our valley, and again, I was one of them, do not realize is that 54% of the kids in the school district are minority. They're no longer white when I was, like I was, like it was when I went to school here. Um, better than half are living in poverty. Um, you know, it's a, it's a different demographic, again, than it was 10 years ago. I don't think they have a clue as to what is up here. And unfortunately, the community college is out of sight. You're behind a hill, you're in a canyon. You don't even know that you're here. I think you've done an incredible job with that. But I really like Mike's idea of having something in the downtown core to where it really is in the community. And I guess, again, going back to that audience of high school students and their parents, two things. One is, I think the marketing and messaging from the community college is critical. I think you gotta go out with a message that you're affordable and you need to say, this is what it costs to get a credit versus going to a university. If you wanna go to the university, great, but you can get two years of it here at the community college for probably a tenth of the price. Um, or, better yet, you get this certificate from the community college and you get this job. You know, equate the education with getting a job. I mean, I think that messaging, you know, is critical. It's important to say these are the programs available to you, but you got to kind of get to the point of you get this in order to get this, a job. And I think when you, you know, again, when we go on to these high school campuses on these, you know, I wish Tracy were here. Um, I think you've got to really, you know, to parents and to kids, you've got to be really connecting the dots like that. And the other thing I'd like to mention is that, personally speaking, again, and I'm, this is kind of out there, but I really would love to see some innovation in terms of taking advantage of facilities that are already in place. In other words, you know, pick a high school like HUG or Sparks where you've got the WCSD doing their signature academy there with students during the day, but then Truckee Meadows comes in and offers something there either to the same students, maybe it's, you know, faculty or it's parents at night. You know, it would transform Sparks High School to have a presence from a community college in that neighborhood. Uh, you know, it's same with HUG. I mean, we've got a couple of inner city schools or Libby Booth Elementary downtown. You know, these schools are the center of those neighborhoods. Those surrounding people go to those schools for everything, whether it's Medicaid, food bank, you know, education, whatever. Take advantage of what's there and let's try to really improve the community. Um, you know, so I think, I know I'm kind of rambling, but I think, uh, I think there's real opportunity there. Again, but we gotta, we gotta speak to those high school students and their parents. And we gotta, we gotta do it quickly. 
Um, no, I yeah. totally agree. I, I do know we have just what you're talking about, and we haven't advertised it widely, in one or two high schools where the high school kids leave, but then they can come back, and, and we're using their site. Yeah. And we're using their equipment. I know Booster's and it's either one, one of or them. two colleges, yeah. one or two campuses, and I, I, I can't remember. I'll get more information on that. But obviously, it's not out there enough yeah. for uh, to, to get the kind of publicity <coughs> it needs to get. Um, trying to get the message out. We have a whole list of things we've already done. The school district's doing some things. There's a lot more, I'm sure. Yeah, I really do. I think you know. Again, I think there's got to be some real creative thinking there because. Uh, I know, like, one of the things we fund with the foundation is Parent University. It's trying to get parents engaged. Um, and that's been around for only three years. And they're trying to find creative ways, again, to engage more of those hard-to-reach parents. And, uh, you know, I just think it takes getting the right people together and getting very creative about how, how you pull them in again using that, that high school as kind of the meeting point. Now, we do participate in an annual event that's uh, housed over at and hosted by UNR. We get about four or 500 uh, of the, uh, from middle to high school parents, and we do a sales <coughs> pitch in both English and Spanish there. So we have that, and then we have multiple other things that we are doing, we've listed. We can do more. We can do more, I'm sure. I, I mean, you what should we be doing to make this all? Assume you know we're we're going to assume that your numbers you know if those numbers are good. We we well, there's I a have, lot to do. I could talk for hours, but I think probably two or three things that really I think are important. One is our funding education at the state is broken and it's oriented towards universities. Yeah. And yeah. yet, <clears throat> less than ten percent of our Nevadans will ever get a degree. Far less in most cases, um, and 80 plus percent of the jobs we're bringing to this community can be met. The needs of those employers can be met with community college certi certifications of some sort. So we're meeting the employer demands 80 percent, and yet we put so much of our funding towards that. You know that 10 percent or less. I think the number seven percent, but you can pick whatever numbers you want. So we're leaving the 93 percent to kind of fend for themselves. And the subset of that is high school degrees, while interesting, are merely a stepping stone to a certification and a job. And so helping people understand that it's that you really, it doesn't matter what piece of paper you have, the ma what matters is do you have a job. Mm -hmm. And so helping the education institution connect their efforts with employers' opportunities, and up here more than ever, we're gonna have incredible opportunities, and yet we're, we tend to think in the which is fantastic, but in the 60, you know, more t more techie manufacturing job number a year as as fantastic when the need is 600 or 2,000. Mm -hmm. So we're and we're not willing to orient funding towards the need. What we do is we build a model that, in fact, up here is going to hurt us. If we had a region here; they probably listen. We do. I, I we do. I'm being sure. facetious. <laughs> 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 um, but then, but what's hurting? even more so is we're going to have people that are going through degree through our, through our technical programs getting to a point where they're not ready to graduate but they're going to be getting offered jobs that double or triple their salary and they're going to dump the program and go take the job and the, and the community college is not going to get credit for them and you're going to have their funding cut so we're less capable of meeting the needs of our employers so the model is broke I think that's something we're all very interested in. That was something I hadn't thought of. Those students who get to a certain point, but they do have the job opportunity and they're going to leave. Uh, and you know, one, on the flip side, we're going to have to encourage employers to encourage the people they hire to finish. But, uh, and that's something we try and do, but that's sometimes that's hard because they say, you know, life happens. They now have a job and they're going to get on with their life. And, uh, well, thank you. I and I certainly want to. We'll continue on around. John, do you have some um, thoughts on how? Well, I, we I can completely agree with what Mike said regarding funding. <clears throat> I know we have one of the the regions here. They don't set the funding, but 
fixing the state of Nevada when it comes to the legislative fix is, is only, I think that that only gets accomplished at the ballot box. But until we have a cultural shift in this state to value higher education, I think a lot of the things that you're talking about are really difficult to get done. But on, on a more local level, because I, I'm in the sciences, and I appreciate the discussion about manufacturing and certificates and things like that, but that's only one third of our mission. And the other two thirds, one, one of those which is significant is university transfer. And that is a huge percentage of our students. That's where we can change for us. If we have to live with this funding formula that we have, one of the things that we have to do, and, and Maria, she knows this really well, is to increase our graduation rate in those associate's degrees. For example, with the funding formula in place, I teach biology, a student passes my biology course, we get paid twice. And that takes us into two realities. One is within our own institution to say, you know, we can't, no offense to our new, new vice president, but we can't just set some sort of number of, well, you know, if you don't have 20 students, then we're not gonna run a class because that is one of our institutional problems. But if I have 15 students, we're gonna pay twice. That's 30, isn't that right? So, you know, we get, we get paid at 2.0 for that in certain courses. So attracting those students to other kinds of areas, I personally think that I'm really glad that TMCC has gone to bachelor, bachelor's degrees in associate science, but I also think that there's a lot in the sciences, and Mike, uh, and I might be going on a little long here too, but Mike, you have on here a biotech manufacturing company with a headquarters with 70 people here. Uh, this is very likely that they would come here. Biotech, and I'm a molecular biologist and I did research for years. Biotech is one of those things that, you know, if somebody goes, then other people start to follow. And, you know, to prepare students to go into those fields, which are very lucrative, you know, we kind of have to attract them. And what I'm saying is that I think TMCC needs to pursue, after we do these bachelor's degrees that we have now, we need to kind of pursue these other bachelor's degrees that aren't going to compete head to head with, you know, UNR. But that, that's, that's a, a big thing that we have to do. So we have to complete our college graduation rate with the students that we have, which is retention, persistence rates, and I think we are doing some of that. Uh, it's, we've made great progress. But the other thing I just want to, this is where I'll finish, is a bunch of you have mentioned the cultural shift, and, and I know a lot about this from just what I do, and the cultural shift is trying to go from, and there are articles written all over in academics about this. You know, every parent wants their kid to be a brain surgeon, but the reality is there are only so many spots. And the AMA sets that. This is how many brain surgeons you get. So if you're not gonna be one of those, what else are you gonna do? And I, I don't know how you shift the culture to say, everybody's not gonna get a master's degree or a doctorate or an MD or a DDS, but there are all these other things that are exciting. So how do we market to students to say that, you know, maybe your mom and dad think you're gonna be a, a pro athlete or a brain surgeon, but really what's the reality there are a lot of things to do and so i don't know how tmcc markets this broadened view of there are a lot of things to do in life that are exciting and we do have a problem in the sciences with that we have, for example we have 3,000 declared community health science majors that are coming through my department and of those 3,000 students they all want to go to nursing school and we have how many slots in nursing school uh, dr buchanan not enough. 32 or 64, and we've got 3,000 students who want to do that. The reality is that I can't pass them all, I can't give them all an A to go to nursing school. So where do they go? And we're, we're trying to develop those programs, but that's where we do need more assistance from the board, the legislature, and those things. So those, those are my ideas. I but don't know if they helped you or not. pathways yes. for, because, so within the health, that's something we could think of within different industries, is if, you know, here are the 50 other things that you can do that are exciting careers in healthcare. Yeah, and, and Mike said that, you know, the more jobs you bring in, the more nurses you're gonna need, the more physical therapists you're gonna need, the more technicians, 
that kind of snowballs. Yes. And some of those are baccalaureate level jobs. They're, they're excellent jobs. And I think that that's kind of where we also have to expand our thinking inside internally as well as externally. So. Thank you sure. very, very much. Dee Dee? No comments. No comment? So many right. comments. Uh, <laughs> what should we be doing? Get lunch. I will yeah. be back. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, I like his thinking. I, I, I just hear marketing, 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 and, and our marketing department, uh, the changes I have seen yes. in the past two or three years, because I come from a marketing background, radio and television and stuff like that. Um, I've seen some, some amazing changes in our marketing strategy, but I think it seems to be what I'm hearing like from John about marketing to, um, uh, to the business sector and Michonne, something that I've been beating on forever, which is marketing to the kids themselves and marketing to their parents, you know, and tying it to what, what John's saying. Um, I remember the MBA glut. Everybody remember the MBA glut of the 70s? All of a sudden, everybody had an MBA. Um, and then everyone, everyone had a law degree, and now everyone has computer science degrees to the point where we have, uh, you know, the term microsurf was coined, meaning people who can write code working for nothing, all waiting for that big break, you know, so they can sell to Microsoft and take their $10 billion and move to the Bahamas. Yeah. Um, I, I see all that, and I tie it to what Mike's been talking about. And one of the things I know is that when we're trying to attract um, uh, these kind of clean industries and future industries. I came out of the steel mills. The steel mill I worked at in Chicago is now a parking lot. We, we could not beat the Japanese at making steel. We just couldn't in America, unfortunately. Um, but one of the things I've, I've seen across the country in terms of attracting really good, solid corporate partners in our, in our community is, is if you're looking at a corporate headquarters, it's nice to have a lot of golf courses and great weather and tax breaks. But a lot of these folks, uh, the example, because I work with people in the research triangle in North Carolina, so I fall back on that all the time, is one of the key factors to a, a company headquarters and trying to bring a brain trust into an area, into a community, is what's the educational system like? Do I, Mr. PhD um, in biochemical engineering, making a quarter million a year or so, do I want to bring my kids into this environment? Um, uh, or do we stand in fear in Reno of doing what ended up in New Orleans, which is anyone who was anyone, even poor folk, would take three extra jobs to put their kids in private schools because the New Orleans school system uh, uh, was just in total shambles. So I wonder how can we market to business and to, to parents, and I, to me especially to business, to get them to realize that investments in education are really investments in business. You're going to draw more high-end, the real desirable kind of industries if we have a good, solid educational system. And, you know, I, I taught at Sparks High for a year, and I've got an MED, so I don't know what the magic is right now, but we really need to hit that, that like you're saying, that cultural, that paradigm shift to where it's okay to work for a living. We're all not going to be in computers, and we're certainly all not going to work for Tesla at the same time. I don't have the answer. I, I wish I did, but how can we get the business community to really get serious about investing in TMCC as an entity because it's good for business? I think our new programs are fantastic, uh, our four-year programs now, and that we're actually we're not looking at just being a feeder school to um, Harvard on the Truckee. You and our, uh, and I'm a graduate, so I get to make fun of them. Um, <laughs> Uh, I really like the fact that we're looking at boots on the ground, where the rubber meets the road, actually looking at practical certificates to get kids into jobs where they can go down to uh, Costco and buy that brand new 80-inch Vizio TV that's on sale for $3,699. <laughs> I think if we can push that to, to students, that yes, you can get on the scoreboard, you can start making money, build up your credit rating, buy some nice toys, take care of your children, but you don't need six, eight, 12 years of, of uh, post high school education. So I think we're moving in the right direction. I just wish I knew how we could unlock the money box to get more, uh, more grants and endowments in our direction because it does serve the community at every level. We will all be contemplating these things as we say at our company, we don't do the easy things, we do the hard things. So I think that's, we've got the team here that can do the hard things. Stephanie. 
Um, the only thing that I really wanted to touch on, a few people have mentioned just the difference in affordability between UNR and TMCC, and I think that is something that people are becoming more and more aware of, especially with the state um, increasing tuition statewide. You know, 4% because UNR's tuition was already so much higher than ours, it's going up that much more. So the opportunity for prerequisites for transfer students, I think, is becoming just more, more known in the community. So we have that niche. And then we have the niche of returning students. You know, people, I had a, someone in a class last semester with me that was 77 years old and coming back to, you know, get an education. And you don't see that at the university level. And you see, you know, adults coming back for vocational training so they can get higher in the careers that they're already in. So we definitely have a niche market. We just need to, you know, that, that support of the community and this council, you know, that's what I see the purpose of this council is the community communicating with the college and making sure that we're both meeting each other's needs. And, and that's going to take this entire community really far. Thank you very much. Um, I, very exciting. I'm starting to see, uh, if we have the list here of, you know, all the wonderful things that everyone proposed that we could do, but I'm seeing them sort of coalescing into two groups, if, as it were. Uh, John, as you started saying, uh, getting out there and talking to the people that run companies in this area, no matter what their uh, affiliation, whether it's uh, health care or it's uh, manufacturing or it's IT or however it fits into the sector councils. And on the other hand, the real driver of all of this, without which none of it makes any sense at all, is getting the students into the institutions to get the skills to work in the jobs. So we're sort of looking at the two ends of the community and from hearing from everyone here uh, from Truckee Meadows, there is an awful lot going on that I think that rather we certainly don't want to reinvent the wheel. What we want to do is to support from a community sense getting our students into this fine institution or even other institutions is a wonderful thing we can do for the community. And so, and on the other hand, if we're talking to, you know, we can get corporate sponsors for things, we are directly helping the institution. So I, my suggestion is, because I said I wanted this group to actually work and do things, I would like to see maybe from those of us who are here and if somebody didn't show up at the meeting, we're going to assign them. Uh, <laughs> you know, don't, don't miss meetings around here. Um, to a committee, and I, I would like to see maybe two committees or three committees, you know, your choice, you're here, of to work with specific individuals at TMCC on what programs they already have in place. Let's say, you know, if a group is working, if three of us say, all right, we're going to go around and we're going to get our, start calling our friends and we're going to find out exactly who of the corporate people that are here are engaged. And if they're not engaged, we're going to try and get them in to set up a program for that in conjunction with what TMCC is already doing so that we don't bump into, every, you know, yeah. start, we don't confuse people. The biggest problem is communication. It, everything's about communication. And even having run a company in Carson City for 36 years, we are often confused as to who do you call at a particular institution to find out what's happening. And so we get, you know, across things. So we want to be able to provide the corporate people a very clear picture of all the great things that TMCC can do for them and how they can engage. So I'd like to see that group, but on the other hand, the other side looking at it, how can we, again, working with TMCC and Washoe County School District and Carson City School District, encourage the students to get into the programs? Now, I know personally, because I do dream of doing it in Nevada, uh, Washoe County's doing some incredible things, but they're going to need 
some more funding. They did get a wonderful grant to go out and encourage students. How can we help them do that more? How can we not only sell to the kids, you know, you've got to think about your career. You do have to take math. You can't graduate and then just wander in and find a job someplace. And to connect them to Truckee Meadows, who has already made the connections with many of our industries. So we have a number of connections, but I would sort of like to focus sort of on those two. Does that make any sense that, so that we can start moving forward? Colleen, yes. I just have another comment because um, we had started a program. It was called Operation Healthcare Bound. I don't know if any of you have heard of it, but we held it at the, we used to hold it at the convention center and it was, the focus was healthcare. And so we invited many different entities that had different representation of different allied healthcare positions, nursing, mm -hmm. and we had about 40 vendors. We charged a nominal fee for a vendor booth. And now um, we've kind of turned that program over to High Sierra AHEC and we participate in that. But we get over 500 students and parents that come to that. Mm -hmm. And they go to the different booths and we've asked the vendors to be interactive with the students. And we have people there that have microscopes with slides to be a lab tech. Um, because I think most students, when they think of healthcare, they think, you have to start your career in a hospital, mm -hmm. right? Or you have to be a nurse or you have to be a doctor. Um, and I think this really opens up a lot of um, different aspects of healthcare that kids can see. But maybe it would be an opportunity for those manufacturing entities or that need employees to be able to put something like this on that TMC may, CC maybe would do and invite corporate entities to come to talk to the students about, you know, what, what positions are available out there and what the demand is. I think there's a gap between, you know, students think, well, I, okay, I'm going to go to college and I want to be a biologist. But they don't know that there's not that many biology positions open out there. So there's a gap in knowing what the demand is for kids that are looking to further their education versus what they want to do mm -hmm. and um, you know so I think corporate inviting corporate entities to come and say this is what's available this is what you might make every year we've worked with um, John Packham and High Sierra AHEC to put together a book and it goes through all the positions of health care what they make a year what the hiring um, capacity is for the state how many positions they have available in the state that are already in that. Um, and, you know, even nursing positions, you can put through as many nurses as you want, but facilities can only hire so many that don't have experience. So even if the demand for nursing is high, you have to have a balance between experienced nurses and those that are new because the gap between academics and um, clinical is so big. So. I just think that um, you're bringing up an absolutely in incredible point. Not only congratulations and thank you for doing that. I mean, oh, that thanks. is just unbelievable. And this is something that in manufacturing we've been talking about a lot. And we do have, you know, there's pathways. And exactly you know, if you have this degree and you have this job and you take this course, you will make so much money. And this is very, very powerful. And the sort of thing. But part of what we need to do, not only working with the community college, but working with groups like yours is to find out these great programs that are out there, the, these events that are occurring, and get kids to them. Because in this community, there is so much happening, and it's so exciting. But nobody knows what the, you know, in other words, it's not communicated. So even though there's an awful lot happening, sometimes we don't know what's happening. I, I think exactly what um, Marissa is talking about is what burning glass is supposed to do. It's a huge investment. Right, but it's still not going to tell us that she, you know, that they have this wonderful event. You know. oh, uh, See, that's what I'm events. saying. There's so many events, and, and it's such a good idea. Now, can we replicate that for the IT industry? Can we replicate that for to get kids to learn what those industries are about? Agriculture, there's wonderful things happening in agriculture, and we do need people in that area. Um, um, Holly, I know you're looking yeah. for a result at the yeah. end of this meeting, I and it am. looks like there are two different areas that so may So I was kind of mentioning those two areas. So could we, if I 
I'm just trying to, as I say, we want to make sure this committee actually does something. Did that sound that we should maybe study what is happening out there within these areas, or does anybody else have a suggestion? So there are two areas yeah. that you mentioned. One would be our career and technical areas, and what is right. happening in the corporate connection. There yeah. we could get all of the advisory committees so that you could see what's in place, what mm -hmm. are we doing. So right. that would be one group. Another group would be what is that collaboration with the school district and what do we have in place already and where do we need to go uh, if you separate it yeah. that way. Right. Okay. Does that make sense? And I don't think, I mean, we can look at, there's the ct &E, but also, you know, just in corporate. In other words, let's get the banks in here. I mean, we know they're already supporting things. All corporate. Let's all corporate. In other words, I don't care who they are. They, they need people. I mean, the banks need employees. The, everybody does. And as we say in very often, most businesses are the same. 50% of them are identical, whether it's a casino or my manufacturing plant or a hospital. It's a building that must be maintained. You need accountants. You need guys to fix the HVAC. You need someone to wash the floors. They're pre the trucking mess. There's this band that everybody needs the same people. And that's a core that we have to make sure as those skill levels go up on those jobs and the demand goes up that we have those individuals available. Yes, sir. Uh, one of, well, one of the themes that I've heard today is marketing. Yeah. So I, my question is to everybody, um, as Barbara would say to all y'all, yeah. the, the question <laughs> is how do we get more money into marketing because I do see where, you know, I fly a lot, I go to the airport, I see as I affectionately call it, UN comma R, because I went there as well. Though you, some of you that have been here for a long time remember the dash comma debate. Yeah. So um, how do, you know, I see their stuff, but I don't see our stuff. And I know it's a question of money. So the question is, how do you get more money into our marketing group, which by the way, I agree with Hank, has done a, has done a mm -hmm. great job. Yeah. But I think we need more of it. Yeah. I, I think um, a marketing presentation is in order. Uh, to take a look at how the uh, dollars are spent right now. How do you determine the best return on investment? Mm -hmm. um, there's a whole set of steps that our, our wonderful uh, marketing public information does in communicating the message. But how they spend their money is tracked to how they get the best return on it. So and, and I think that kind of uh, a presentation would be helpful to all. Do, is it possible that the foundation can augment that budget in marketing as well? Well, let's take a look at the need first. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And so there's a needs analysis that goes into where do you spend money. So sometimes just more money spent right. doesn't equal, um, you know, the best return that you want. Okay. So I, like I think that. we need that analysis. I, I know that a lot of work has been done in that area in terms of determining how the best return can be achieved. Yeah. So okay. until we know that, yeah. we don't know how much more we need. Right. You know, and I, I look at it like, who's your audience? Yeah. Who is your yeah. audience? It's not me standing at the airport waiting for my bag. Yeah. It isn't. You know, and, that, and don't, I don't, don't take that quite so strongly, because you do have an image that you want to portray mm -hmm. out there also. So you have, there's a certain amount that's positive for that. But when you have a very limited budget, who is your audience? Yeah. And I think there's a, just a lot of, uh, sorry, thank you. Actually, and you know, I liked your, I thought, I really did think that what you, what you did with what you have is really very good. I really mean that. It's very pointed. Point out that the audience is the first thing I listed for you. Yeah, it's young, it's high school students, or students from like, what'd you say, 15 to 22? Because you, you, you run past high school. Sorry. Kate Kirkpatrick, for the record. Um, our audience is, of course, we focus on our current students first to make sure that they re-enroll and finish their programs. And then our secondary audience is prospective students, uh, high school juniors and seniors. Their parents are our secondary group for that. And then focusing on our 25 and older non-traditional students. And finally, people who are looking from their Hispanic families, we're trying to reach that 25% HSI serving institution. And so we're we're at 24.9, we're so close. So we're trying to make that our, our final audience that we're trying to talk to. 
So when you when you mention that that that's the universe because you're saying high Basically. school students 25 and older that's pretty much everybody. If you had to prioritize within that group of the people that you're really soliciting to come to the community college, what audience makes up the majority of the people that are coming here? Well, we tend to get our, non, our regular traditional age students and their parents kind of as one big audience, but that opens it up to 16 to 45. Um, and we know that that audience also hits our current students, so they are seeing our marketing in the same places because they are generally in that same group. I guess where I'm going with this is that, you know, it's really honing in on that audience. And to me, there's a lot of things that we can be doing uh, that doesn't take money, frankly. Right. It's relationships, it's connecting dots. Mm -hmm. And again, um, you know, I love what you're talking yeah. about with this health care, yeah. you know, and having a, a trade show, for lack of yeah. a better word, you know, showing people what's it's available. Fabulous. You've got Hug High School, who I think has a healthcare oriented signature academy. Can you take a piece of that and go to Hug High School and do the same thing? You know, because again, you know, you're, you're reaching, you know, you're looking to align some of these things. And I think you've done a great job. I hope you're not offended by what I'm saying, because I think that there's more openness now than there ever has been because of the leadership at these, at your institution and others. But you can just see what it opens up. You've got a healthcare um, program going in down near Galena. Is there an opportunity with that high school, you know, to um, collaborate? Um, you're going to have a great facility there. I mean, so that's what I look at is how do you leverage what we already have. so many of the good things you're doing, you know, is really a matter of going and knocking on somebody's door and saying, hey, we'd like to work with you. And I know we're doing something Galena, with Galena, and I know there's yeah. a tight relationship there. So that's yeah, more of the information we should yeah. have in detail. That, so that's what I was thinking. What we've Some already of these done committees is no, could, yeah. now, in other words, really, you know, one or two people to sit with people here and really be able to write up a program that yeah. this group as a group could engage in, but to take the opportunity to learn specific and a very focused learning experience as to what we can do to augment without well, having a lot again, of additional resources. With the goal yeah. of putting the community um, colleges programs out there, your marketing, yes. your program, you know, you're saying here's the pathway mm -hmm. again. And we're marketing two directions. We're marketing yeah. to the corporate headquarters and we're marketing to the students. Yeah. Is that? Yes, yes, sir. Absolutely. For a regent to attend a meeting and not say something would be wrong. <laughs> and now I know John Albrecht, legal counsel, shaking because, you know, it's been a very smooth meeting when he doesn't have to speak. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say thank you for uh, allowing me to come. I, I happen to be in town and a meeting broke out, so here I am. But uh, I went to WNC's the day before uh, TMCC's graduation. And they were at the point, they had a great meeting, but theirs was more organizational. They were just getting started. And what I saw today uh, at this meeting has been phenomenal. And Kali, I'll tell you what, you're welcome to chair any of my boards anytime. You, you are focused and you know where you're going and you know how to get uh, people to interact. And, and I think you've done a phenomenal job. <clears throat> Before I when, I, when I ran for the Board of Regents, I sat in your chair. I was the advisory council chair at GBC. So I know what you're going through. And what we were dealing with was they had already always had one, and it had become more of a show and tell. We would show up, faculty would come make presentations, and we'd all go home. And there wasn't as much advising as anywhere near what I've heard today. And I know this is an action item, but you have already provided a lot of advice to President Sheehan. I mean, I've sat here hearing, wow, there's a lot of projects. You've given lots of input. Sometimes you don't have to make motions to direct uh, because it's very clear if you've been in this meeting what, what needs to be dealt with, what the concerns are, and, and how to move forward. And so the chair and the president can work on agendas and all that. Um, but I, I just think you, you've done a, a wonderful job. You have a great makeup of your committee. And uh, we have to remember why these were established. Uh, one of the things we're trying to do is, is make uh, community colleges extremely, uh, a lot more important in the work that regents do in the state. And that's why we have the Community College Committee. 
and it meets off cycle so that we have all the time in the world we need to, to uh, deal with uh, issues from institutions, to find out what we as regents can do to better help each institution meet their goals. Maybe it's changing a policy, maybe it's adjusting something, maybe it's uh, more focus on something. And so I think, I'm, I'm really excited about where we're headed with this. And, and because of the kind of action you do at your committee, makes it more effective for our committee. And that's what, that's what we need. And of course, you're sitting on our, on our committee. And by the way, September 2nd, you know, at the system office is our next meeting. And I will be in Reno for that. And uh, you're welcome to come, make public comment or comment on things at that meeting too. Um, I had the opportunity of sitting through some of these presentations yesterday with Maria and some of her staff, and uh, I'm very excited about what's what's happening here. Uh, there are two items that I heard today that I think uh, were said, were stated, were, um, but, but I think need to, to really be heard again, and that is one, there was concern uh, enough to put it on the agenda, but also uh, uh, former president, Glotney uh, mentioned about police services. You know, uh, it was brought up and it's on the agenda. And so why is it on the agenda? Because it wants some input, maybe it wants some advice. And so I think that might be an area where, where you need to have more discussion, either individually uh, with advisory committee meetings to, to talk to President Sheehan. Uh, um, I, I have concerns about that situation. Uh, I just heard it was coming back up. So. Um, it's not a done deal, and it will be on the agenda, I understand, in September and December for discussion. And how it moves forward, I think uh, it would be very advantageous, if not <clears throat> today, because you don't maybe have enough information, but before the December meeting to have that as a discussion and maybe make a recommendation to, to the uh, community college committee, which then reports to the, to the regents. The other one <coughs> is about the funding. Uh, funding formula seems to get beat up a lot, and I understand why. You know, I live in Elko and uh, GBC as well, and Western, and everyone took a hit. But we have to be careful that we don't pit community colleges against universities, because th the real problem is not f the funding formula, because the old one was broken severely. Uh, it's a revenue problem. And you know, when, when we have less revenue, everyone wants their same piece of the pie, and that can't happen. So um, one of the things we're hopeful for is this year was, uh, Superintendent Davis has left, uh, was the year of K-12 pretty much. We're hoping that 2017 is the year of higher education. And that's why these committees and the community college committee are so important because we have two, well, really a year uh, and a bit to get the agenda out there, how important it is for more funding to accomplish all the things that we're talking about uh, with, with the workforce development, with everyone coming into town, how are we gonna provide, how are we gonna graduate more, how are we gonna address things? So I think it's a great opportunity, and I know people are looking at the funding formula to saying, okay, we all know it's not perfect, how do we fix it? And, I, and I'm sure President Xi and everyone is already in some discussions and are gonna continue those discussions. So instead of just beating it up and saying it doesn't work, let's come up with some solutions to how it will better fit everyone and, uh, and fix them. And, and, and it has to do with revenue, <laughs> a lot of it. Uh, the other thing that I, I heard was about jobs and the number of jobs coming into the community. I moved to Elko in 1980 for a year or two and I've been there for 35 years. And so I have had the opportunity of living through the entire mining boom, bust, and boom again. And there's good with the bad, and you're going to experience that in Reno as well. I read the articles all the time in the Gazette Journal about the concerns and the issues and all this. And one of the issues that I, I, we see constantly that hasn't been addressed, and it has to do with workforce, is not only are there not enough people in the workforce, but those of you who already have a workforce are going to lose your workforce to new industry. And how do we get people to fill those jobs? Um, your fast food restaurants, your hotels, your, you know, when, when some of these uh, people come to Elko to get pretty decent jobs, and then after a year or two, they run into all their friends who are making twice the money at a mine, and pretty soon they're off to the mines, it's hard to, to retain employees. So it's, it's that whole spectrum. There's a piece that, that you don't see yet that's going to invade, it just is the nature of the beast. 
And so anyway, uh, just a few comments, and I hope they're helpful, but I, I really can't thank you enough for the work you're doing and how well your committee is operating. It is really the model and what the vision was when we created these. So uh, we want advice, but you know, President Sheehan is the, is the fir first person who gets the advice, the chancellor, the, the system, the regents, and we look forward to seeing how we can continue to help uh, TMCC and all the community colleges. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, to try and keep this on course, um, very quickly, we do, um, I don't know that we need a motion, but what do we feel about if, if we assign, or maybe you would have a motion, if I kind of write up something and we ask people to sign up for, you know, two committees or so, just to do some investigative work to see how we can move forward, does that make a certain amount of sense that we've kind of identified these two things? We know there's a myriad of things we can deal with, but let's take something small and see how we function and see how if we can have a success with that. Does that make some sense? And we'll ask you what committee you'd like to be on, but the people that weren't here, they get assigned. <laughs> Just uh, if you're getting ready to do homework assignments, um, yeah. one of the things I'd offer is that maybe every uh, committee member be tasked with coming back with two things they can do to help market the community college. Right. Now we have a, a wonderful list, and so if we work with this a little bit more and refine that, I think that's a great idea. But every one yeah. of us has a different sphere of influence, yeah. right. different people, and maybe yes. it's as simple as, you know, forwarding Maria's update, or maybe it's, you know, it could be a really simple thing or it could be a more complicated thing. But so forcing us to be part of the free, if you will, marketing component yeah. of the system. Perfect. So basically two two ideas. Does that sound mm -hmm. sure. great? Did you get that? Yes, got it. Okay, good. I'm not great at notes. Lisa has a two. Okay, Lisa has a two. Wonderful. Is So does that sound agreeable as a way to move forward so that we are actually having actions and Try we're going to go out there and go, you know, you know, as they say, you know, a journey starts with the first step. Well, I think let's just take a first step and move forward. Um, New business. Okay, new business. And uh, for the next um, agenda, for the next meeting, uh, we would like to, uh, we have some suggestions for new business, uh, which I'm going to actually ask Maria to read. And then uh, if anybody has any additions, uh, please speak up. Anybody? Yeah, yes, sir. Thank you for the opportunity. I'm Thomas Daubert. I'm with the IT department for TMCC. And I would like to draw your attention to item 4C, which is Mr. Woodbeck's letter, uh, his response to Dr. Sheehan. And on the third, um, in the third paragraph, he's talking about the Nevada College Collaborative. And I'm quoting him here so you don't have to look it up. Uh, we are reassessing the implementation of shared services for information technology. And maybe we can get some more clarification on that. Excellent. Are we done trying to combine them or are we real? Is there a new approach to this? Thank you very much. That's excellent. Okay, so for potential items, and we'll see if the council wants to add that last one we just heard, but I heard police consolidation update. <laughs> Would you like a police consolidation update? My only question with that is, are they going to be deciding it before we have our next meeting? No. They're not deciding it at the September Regents meeting? Oh, it's the September meeting, yes. But that's 10th or 11th. Won't be a final decision. It's just as long as we're able to have time to... Yeah, it's on right. the agenda. So there will be just a meeting of this group on September 2nd, correct? No. No. no, no. None of this group. No, uh, November. Script. In November, we will meet again. Right. This yeah. does not go to, oh, December. this goes in September 10th, yes. 11th. But that is a decision uh, not to implement. That is a decision to, for the board to take a look at it. I just think, you know, we, I think we can express concern. It, it has to go before the Board of Regents twice. So it'll be on the September and the December meeting. And I understand the September meeting, they're going to begin the discussion and talk about that. So with that said, uh, because you don't have another meeting to really get all the information, my recommendation would be that maybe individually some of you meet with President Sheehan 
police chief, whoever it is, and get more information and maybe show up and talk at that meeting. Uh, you might even make, uh, on the September 2nd, the community college committee, you could uh, share your concerns and say, we, we would like to visit about that or, or what have you. But I, I wouldn't totally wait till December, right. in November, right. you know, but the final decision, from what I understand, will not be made till December. Between now and then, there'll probably be a lot of talk, a lot of meetings. You know, President Sheehan is more involved with it, obviously, than I am. I just heard it coming up again. Because it was kind of on again, off again, and I just heard it was back on the agenda. So uh, they're, they're, we're looking at it, and um, I'm going to look very hard at it. So uh, I think you should, too, and I think you should uh, talk to President Sheehan and see where she could use your support in, in dealing with that. Very good. Thank you, sir. Parking and transit update. Yes, we can. Yes. Since the things we've started on, if we can. A marketing presentation. Yes. Uh, the art student, um, the art center student life. Any interested yeah. in looking yeah, at we that? We have, again? Um, I think, some information. If we could be provided information, I don't know that we need to spend uh, time on a presentation at this point. It's very exciting. The marketing, the, the, the parking one, we absolutely yeah, need your yeah. input on. Right. We could wait on that one. I think an epic uh, follow-up, you know, so if we take yes. the chart and take a look at what are we providing in these areas, how many students are we able to, yeah. or do right. we? Right, in other words, what is our capacity? What is our capacity mm -hmm. right capacity now? capacity study here. Then I, I think you want to talk about new council members as well. Right. We. Uh, how many council members are we, al uh, What do we know what the maximum is? Does anybody? I want to say it was 13. I 13, because we're at 11 now. So perhaps if other people have, anybody has any suggestions as to who might want to join us on this very exciting journey we're on, uh, <laughs> to please let Maria know. Um, the last item was a clarification on IT shared services, which has been up right. and down. And well, I think we can look thing. at the entire shared services. You know, in other words, we're looking at consolidation of other areas that's, that that was all part of the same. Um, we're not looking at consolidation. We're looking at shared services. The yeah, only consolidation right. plan is police. Oh, okay. So, so far. Right, so far. So let's put them on and then uh, as we build the agenda, we'll find out how much time we have. At least we'll get the information to everybody. Sounds good. Okay, and can we just agree that we're going to follow up and with some committees and yes. to do something and uh, mm -hmm. we'll do that. Um, any more public comment? Anybody? Yes, ma'am. I don't know a whole lot about marketing. <clears throat> Sorry, Dee Dee Siegel, Classified Council President. I don't know a whole lot about marketing. However, uh, most of what I've been hearing um, is, well, we need to market to people from age 16 and up, but what I'm not quite understanding is why aren't we even starting at a lower level than that with the governor wanting to throw money into education because we are at the bottom of the, the food chain. Why, why are we not going to those kids to raise them and growing them up on the TMCC logo and name? Yeah, I like right. it. Very good. Excellent. I, I just had one comment because I've received a couple of emails you'll like this. <clears throat> People have asked me, why are we eliminating the TMCC Police Department? So for everybody that's here, would you just get the word out that we are not eliminating the Police Department? Um, because this is one of those things that can turn into a flame quickly. Mm -hmm. So we're not doing that. Okay. okay. Very good. Even and if there's consolidation, consolidation, it's not okay. elimination. So. It Thank is you. eliminating the TMCC police force as we know it and right. putting it under a consolidated UNR. We will have, if, if the proposal is approved by the board, we have UNR police force. Right, which I which I sent that out. But the concern is we are not going to have 
any police. Oh, that's, that's that's what true. I want to no, make sure that that's that, that not true. rumor so is not true. Yeah. The TMTC. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Kyle will not be carrying any you know, tasers or anything like that. So. <laughs> okay. Um, it is now five after twelve. Uh, may I get a motion to adjourn? I move to adjourn. Thank you. Second. I second. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, everybody from the TMCC family for being here.